Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Avatar Online Podcast. This is going to be our North and South Part 1 review special. Uh, we're recording this on September 18th, 2016, and I'm your main host as usual, Morgan Airspeed Prime, Site Super Moderator for Avatar The Last Airbender Online.com. Joining me first on the podcast is Greg, Greg2B from the site. What's up, everyone? And also joining us is Kelly, Gemini530 from the site. Hi, everyone. Excellent. So, the only thing we have planned for the show today is reviewing North and South Part 1. So that is exactly what we're going to get straight into. So, Avatar The Last Airbender, North and South Part 1, written by Jean Luen Yang, art and cover by Team Guri Huru, and lettering by Michael Heisler. We'll start, as we always do, with some quick overall non-spoiler thoughts, and then we'll get into going through the book page by page. So, Greg, why don't you start us off? Overall, what are your thoughts on the first part of North and South? <laughs> um, overall, I thought it was pretty enjoyable. I thought it was, you know, you know, a good sort of basic sort of intro story to the series. Um, I think it was, you know, a bit, I guess, maybe sort of linear or straightforward. So it wasn't sort of out there all crazy or anything, or maybe, you know, it's just been so long. So we had to sort of, I don't know, taper sort of expectations. But overall, I thought it was pretty enjoyable. And it's, it's looking like it should be, you know, a pretty decent series overall. And what about you, Kelly, your overall quick thoughts? I really liked it, um, but I kind of agree with Greg. It's like it, it felt a little bit like, um, I don't know, like straightforward is kind of a good way of putting it. And um, for the first half of this whole book was just like reintroducing all these ideas, which we should have kind of expected, I guess, because we haven't been here in such a long time. And, you know, it's a good like nostalgia trip and everything. But I kind of wish this book had more things going on in it like it got more interesting in the second half but only so much so and overall it kind of felt like a little like some of the dialogue felt very like uh expositiony or like very like straightforward not all of it just parts of it so um i liked it a lot i love being back in this other water tribe and it's an idea that i definitely after the book continued more and more and so interested in seeing more of like i'm super hyped now but that's almost a problem because we only have this and i want more immediately <laughs> so mm. yeah yeah yeah, it, it, it's basically what i said at the start of my written review on the site um mm -hmm. it's a part one uh, it was such a long wait that we maybe expected more than a part one, but it was always going to just be a part one. And so it's very focused on what it's trying to do. It's to return to the South for the first time in a while. We focus on nostalgia, the old stuff for a while, then introduce the new characters and it's mainly set up. And like we end just before things start to get going. And that's frustrating because like we were waiting so long and now we have to wait again. But what's here is good, uh, and I don't think there's a ton of negatives about this book itself. Uh, the only one that comes to mind is just that the cover obviously lies about something, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, as we go through the book. But um, yeah, that's, that's my basic thoughts. The art, I think, is overall really good. Um, the writing seems pretty solid, and it's, it's shaping up to be a good series. But uh, let's get into this. Uh, so we'll start going through page by page. So if you have the book already, definitely get it out, read along with us. It's probably one of the best ways to kind of analyze as we go through the book. So um, we open up with um, basically young Katara uh, and she's talking to her mother. Her mother has just woken her up uh, and basically Kaya says to young Katara that uh, you have to see this. The snow just stopped. The sun has come out and we get a double page spread of young Katara seeing the village and the whole idea that the village looks brand new and it's definitely a different southern water tribe that we see here much more igloos it seems much more structured but still very much like the south and as we kind of continue on through this we just see continue to see Kaya saying wake up wake up wake up and little Katara saying you know I'm already awake mom how come you don't and then Katara wakes up in the present day still on road to the returning to the southern water tribe so interesting nostalgic way to open it up and uh this for me this opening kind of a few pages really contrasts a lot and i, I are very worth discussing when it comes to the last page of this book um but kelly uh, what were your thoughts on this decision to kind of have this interesting dream sequence for katara 
I really liked it. Um, I remember these were preview pages or something at some point, so I had already seen them. I think it was an Amazon preview page thing. But um, to start the book off this way, I thought was a very good idea. Uh, very interesting. And it's just nice to see Kaya again in this memory of Katara's because we only have the Southern Raiders we ever actually see her do or say anything. And this seems like something Kaya would do in, like, I don't know, like, from based on, like, what we saw in the Southern Raiders. And I, it's just really nice to get a look at what the village looked like when Qatar was a kid. Again, I'm bringing, I'm again, I'm talking about the Southern Raiders, but the only time we ever got to see it, like, when it wasn't destroyed, destroyed, like, it's still small and it's still destroyed so much from what the Fire Nation did by stealing all of its waterbenders. But there's something about it that still feels like a home and still feels stable. You know what I mean? With Kaya being there and with Katara and Sokka being there and like them being happy. So when the Fire Nation came and killed Kaya, that's when everything started falling apart. And I liked seeing the, I liked seeing what it looked like right before that. And it's obviously very much a, you know, Kaya saying, you know, it looks brand new and it's like, obviously that's going to come into play with like what's going on in the Southern Water Tribe right now. Um, I think I think this is going to come back in some way for Qatar mentally, or maybe not. Maybe it was just meant for us to to explore. But I I, I really like the fact that it opens up like this. Mm, and uh, what about you, Greg? Your thoughts on this dream sequence? Um, yeah, no, I, I concur. I really sort of enjoyed getting to see the whole Southern Water Tribe, like you said before. It, it is a nice sort of contrast to what we sort of see later on. So I think it was a a good choice of opening. I mean, it looks very good. You know, the art is very beautiful as always. So I think it's you know it's well worth the double page spread that they gave to this. And you know, the whole transition into Prance of Day, you know, is something you know it's very sort of I guess sort of cinematic. Like it's something that you would definitely see on TV and movies as far as you know the dream sequence you know, reliving into the into the present day. So I think they made a good choice of actually using that as sort of the transitional element there. So no, I think it was a really good part. Mm, yeah, this is basically Katara's expectations. This is what she kind of hopes mm -hmm. and maybe expects to return to. And we obviously get the big contrast between this and the next double page spread. But uh, yeah, and again, it's a, keep, in, keep in your mind as we go through the book, the fact that initially upon returning home, Katara was thinking of her mother. Um, but anyway, we find out that who was calling her for her to wake up was actually Sokka, and basically we get this idea that uh, Katara says, I'm okay, I just had this dream that was happy and sad all at once, but it was mostly happy, and they kind of go out, they've just arrived back at the docks to the uh, northern, the, the southern water tribe, and here we get into the actual, you know, seven page preview that we got, so we can, I think we'll just cover this as uh, as we go straight through, we they see the hill where they initially went penguin sledding from the first episodes. They remember, Katara obviously remembers Aang and herself going penguin sledding. And then uh, Katara and Sokka decide to go as well. We get the page we skipped over with them actually going penguin sledding and we find out what actually happens. So Sokka goes penguin sledding and crashes into this building that's being built. That's right at the end of the hill. Um, and this is where they meet the kids and the workers who are obviously building uh, new things for the Southern Water Tribe. And um, yeah, this is, this is about the point where the kids and the builders are introduced and we get their names a little bit later on. But uh, Greg, what were your thoughts on this, uh, the actual return to the Southern Water Tribe here? Um, yeah, no, I, I thought it was nice. I thought it was a nice little, you know, they had a nice little flashback there. You know, we have a little bit of a sibling sort of banter here, which they threw out throughout the whole sort of comic, which I, I really sort of enjoyed there. Their, you know, their relationship that they have with each other seems like, you know, a real sort of brother-sister there. So I think that was really good. And it's nice just to see them sort of do the penguin sledding and just, you know, it's a nice, you know, sort of trip down memory lane. Um, So it, it works well for, I guess, sort of reintroducing us to the Southern Water Tribe as well as, you know, introducing as to the, the new element that's going to be sort of our, our conflict here. Yeah, you get a lot, a lot of little references like Sokka saying, you know, oh yeah, and you thought he was a spy for the Fire Navy when it was actually Sokka who thought that. But um, Kelly, uh, what are your first uh, thoughts on this uh, penguin sliding sequence here? Yeah, uh, I, I really liked it. It was a, it was a really nice callback. It's because they're back to the location where they were in the first two episodes of this entire show of the, the whole thing starting for the first time. And I, it's just really nice to see. I kind of like how Sok is like, yeah, it reminds me of, of nah, I got nothing. <laughs> like, like he doesn't remember um, when, like, you feel like he's supposed to because it was like the big first two episodes. And you know, Sokka messing around saying it's like, oh, you thought he was a spy for the Fire Navy. Yeah, that was, that's funny. 
and, and it's cute. It's just like, and it's funny to see Sokka ride one of these things and say he never liked it. So I, I don't know. It, it, it's funny to me. It, it's it's cute and it's a nice moment to have before they're kind of, you know, literally hit by this wall or block of like what they didn't expect, which is this um, place being built. Uh, which is, I kind of like how it like gradually leads up to it in the sense that they're like, it's kind of like they they see that something's a little bit different with the shore and they have like, you know, boats there and they're like, oh, that's new. Okay. And then they're like, oh, this is something we used to do when we were kids. And then they hit another new thing and then they're like, well, this is definitely different. And then later they reach the city. So I kind of like that gradual change that they're seeing, but it's still unexpected to them. It, it, was, an, it was a nice scene. Mm -hmm. uh, next part is that we see they meet the kids and the construction workers they come over and they're like didn't you read the sign no trespassing and it's obviously this is where it comes up that there wasn't actually a sign out there so the kids didn't know they were meant to stay away from here the builders start to get annoyed and they basically one of them starts to water bend soccer protects the kids and then they kind of take cover as katara takes over the fight and there's a little exchange a giant snowball is thrown at katara and they think they're going to completely bowl her over, but she blocks it, turns it into a giant spike snowball, sends it flying back at them. She's way more powerful than them, and basically she just diffuses the situation, you know, like you should have put up a fence, you know. Uh, she kind of compromises with the kids that like, you know, yeah, they were being mean, but you shouldn't be playing here. And they agree to walk um, the kids back home, and... They say, you know, you're from the village, who are your parents? And the kids are like, village? What village? You mean the city? And here's where we get that contrasting double page spread of them returning home and the actual Southern Water Tribe, the main village city, is huge. There's giant ice buildings all over the place. They've got a big wall, lots of pools of water, reminiscent of the actual Northern Water Tribe, but not exactly. It's slightly different, but the same style that they're going for here. Tons of people, tons of stands out, uh, complete contrast from where we last saw it, basically. So, very interesting contrast here. But, uh, Kelly, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, this kind of sequence introduced to these builders who we get the names of later on and then the first look into the actual Southern Water Tribe? Yeah, I, re I really like the scene a lot, and I didn't expect those three guys to come back later on, so that's kind of funny. I thought they were just, like, these mean builders, but then later they turn out to be, like, important somewhat at least to the two people who are in charge of this construction um but i really i really like this scene um a lot i don't i don't really know why it's just kind of cute i kind of like how katara and Sokka are really good with kids and really care about kids and it probably because they grew up like with younger you live in you remember from the first two episodes that they were the two oldest people in that tribe and that like they had to basically not like them and the other women of course but like they were like the in-between ages so they were kind of like big siblings all the time even though Katara was technically the youngest sibling and they kind of just took care of each other so I kind of like seeing that again with these kids that they don't even really know you know what I mean like these are new kids but they're they're still like this it's the same thing where they're protecting them just as, and you know even though they were doing something wrong it's 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 nice and these guys were jerks I mean who who fights kids that's just that's just messed up I don't know man. <laughs> um that's, it, it really is um but I do like the reveal when they're like all right where's the village you know and they're like and the kid's like, what village? You mean the city? Like, like he, he's just as like, he has like no concept mm. of like, of what he means, what they mean by village. It just shows how different it is now. Like, you know, not just visually, which yeah, visually, but like, you know, mentally as well. And then the big two pages that contrast the first two pages with the, with the dream sequence. It's, it's pretty crazy because it really just looks like the Northern Water Tribe. And we obviously will get into that later, but you know, it's, while it's good for them to like, you know, not be, tiny and like you know not be disrespected or like you know have have better like a better lifestyle sort of for them maybe it's still you know it's it's very very different and maybe not in a good way and i it's so it's interesting to see that like right from the start mm, yeah it doesn't really look like a tribe like the first double page spread is like it's a tribe there's igloos tents and here there's nothing like that it's just a city but it's made of ice um but greg what are your thoughts on this sequence <laughs> 
Um, you know, I thought it was pretty good. It is definitely sort of a, a stark sort of contrast from before. And it is, you know, I do agree. I think it's nice to see Katara and Sokka sort of work with these kids who, you know, probably weren't around or were, you know, very young when they were part of the village, you know, with the whole, you know, years that they have been away. So it's, it's interesting to see these new kids who have, you know, basically just a whole different sort of concept of what the, the village is now as a, as a city here. And it's really sort of interesting to see that sort of perspective sort of shift here. And, you know, when you actually do get the view of the city um you know it is you know very northern water tribe like like the the whole columns that they have here and the pools of water that you mentioned is is very sort of reminiscent of the northern water tribe it's not you know it's not completely there yet but i think for me what really sort of sets it off is like the whole like sort of steps that they have like that reminds me very much so of the northern water tribe and how it was sort of laid up you know basically it's sort of like a tiered structure to where you get to you know or or where will eventually be sort of the palace um so it definitely is you know interesting to see how it looks now i'm i'm pretty you know interested in seeing where this sort of goes here and you know i guess sort of how far they develop the city and you know i guess where you know the possible sort of compromise will be mm. yeah and, and it's sequences like this where the art really stands out because everything's blue everything's white but it all kind of stands out in its own way but mm -hmm. uh moving to the next sequence and obviously they arrive in and they're like katara says our village is gone and Sokka's immediately like, no, it's better. Just look at this place. It's great. They then spot their auntie Ashuna, who we've obviously had mentioned before. I think in the previous two series, we'd actually have mentioned to her because when they met the two Southern Water Tribe girls in the Rift, they mentioned her. And then they also mentioned her when they were planning to return to the South in Smoke and Shadows. So we finally get to see her here. And she seems to run a stand that sells food, including her famous seal jerky we've heard a lot about already and um she just talks about how business has been steady and it's kind of uh, like that the, the cart that she had before is gone it's been torn down and she now has this full-on stand outside and uh, we see that the jerky is as kind of sturdy as Sokka remembered and Ashina basically calls out to everyone you know like Katara and Sokka are back and everyone comes over to them they call them the hometown heroes they asked him what's the fire nation like is it true that everything's on fire over there one of them asks um and <laughs> you've d you, you've done the southern water tribe proud kids um uh, how come the avatar isn't with you are we going to get to meet him just all of these questions they're celebrities most of the southerners you really get the impression haven't really traveled all that much so them haven't been all over the world is a huge thing and it's um before we get into the next sequence it's just amazing to see how how famous they are and how like respected they are they've, they've really become heroes since they've left and like we know that these people know that through stories but we've followed them along that whole journey but greg uh, what are your thoughts on this the we get to see them interact with the people they've been away from for so long yeah, no, I thought that was very nice. I really liked how they, you know, how the Auntie Ashina sort of brought everyone over. That seemed like, you know, that seemed very sort of communal, very sort of, you know, village sort of tribe like that you just sort of call out to everyone. Everyone sort of comes over and congratulates you. So it's nice to see, you know, that sort of, you know, reaction to, you know, basically a place they've been away from for so many years now. And, you know, they're, they're you know, completely different. They're grown up, you know. There's, you know, Grand Grand makes comments about that in the next page. So I, I really sort of liked how they set this up. Mm, uh, what about you, Kelly? What are your thoughts about the, the scene with Ashina and then them being treated as heroes, basically? Yeah, I really like it a lot. Um, if you really think about it, like, timeline-wise, right? They left at the beginning of the series. A, the whole series is about one year. Then there's the one-year jump in The Promise. And then everything that takes place in between The Promise and the other comics is probably almost a whole other year. Yeah. So they've been away for three years, you know what mm. I mean? And that's that's just really interesting to think about. And it, it's it's so nice that she calls out to everybody and they all come over immediately like like mm -hmm. you know if you're in like an actual i feel like that's something a tribe would do that these people are still very much tribes people even though their environment is very much like city like and everything like you know like the northern kind of was um and it's, it's 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 interesting to to see that and i like the questions that are asked you know like the from the really emotional to the really funny like is everything on fire over there to like you know like home, hometown heroes like that that's a really that's a really cute thing to say and you know what that actually comes back later i just realized that they were like look it's the hometown heroes and he's like and then later when they were like you're celebrities it's like not celebrities heroes baby but not celebrities mm -hmm. it was like that, that that was kind of a funny thing to bring back i just i just realized that um uh 
But I, I but at the same time, some of them ask about the Avatar. They're like, "Oh, is the Avatar here?" Like, like they're kind of like third wheels to him half the time. You ever see? Like, remember? Um, they go back to Kyoshi Island to mm, stop yes. Aang from being framed, and they come and they're like, "Where's Aang?" And they're like, "Sorry, not here." <laughs> like, it's 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 funny to me that they're very often the third wheel to a lot of things. Um, but yeah, no, they're still obviously loved and and heroes to their people, and it's it's so nice to see that, and it's just I don't know, it's just so nice to see the scene, you know, they're back home after so long, and you know, obviously some of them are like men, meaning they went out to the war, so it's been a really long time for them since they've seen them, but then you also have the women who they were in the tribe as well, who knew them from when they were like fourteen and fifteen, so it's it's just so nice, it's it's a, it's 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 just a, a happy moment that's needed considering the rest of the book. And then we get another happy moment as they, one of the people who comes over is Grand Grand, Kana. And they reunite with her, big hugs, you know, we miss you so much. Um, uh, I've missed you two children more than I can say. And they say, you look the same as ever, Grand Grand. And she says, but Sokka's gotten taller. And he says, and more muscular. As Paku arrives and he says, that's Grandpa Paku to you now. And Sokka is like, wow, you, got, you guys got married? And they reveal just a few weeks ago. And Katara's like, but we, and we missed the ceremony. I knew we should have come back sooner. And they reveal that there wasn't a ceremony. We eloped to the Misty Palms Oasis. And they kind of make a comment, you know, it didn't live up to its name. And Grand Grand says that it did because uh, they had the most wonderful time. Paku is such a romantic. And uh, we get this kind of mysterious comment that I'm sure will come back at a certain point where Paku says... Katara, you ought to come visit my school. I'm trying to train up new waterbenders here in the south. I could use your help. Uh, and uh, she says, you started the school, but where did you find students? Well, that's the interesting part. Come visit me when you get the chance. And Sokka makes his joke, I think referencing the promise where he calls himself a motivational bender, but Paku just kind of laughs it off. And they just reveal that they also know about a lot of their tales about what happened to them, how brave Sokka was during the Day of Black Sun, how accomplished of a waterbender Katara's become, uh, and how like their father talks about them all the time. And it's revealed that Hakoda, actually, where is he right now? He's in an office in and in town hall, and they're like, there's a town hall in our town now. So lots of information on this page, page a lot. First one to clear up is that um, Sokka's reaction seems like a continuity error in that he knows that at the yeah. very least these two have been engaged a lot of people have been saying just the whole scenes of continuity error but paku only said that he gave her a betrothal necklace not that they had actually got married during the old masters episode uh it is a it is weird why he's so re like shocked that wait you guys are actually married despite the fact that he knows like there was the whole uh he called paku grand paku that, that that was a joke from that episode so that's a little bit weird but the act them actually only being married fairly recently i don't think is too much of a problem and um, the southern waterbenders being trained is an interesting one in that i assume what that means is that given that three years have passed m some of the uh kids who've been born are probably waterbenders now is probably what they're getting at here that southern southern people are being born who are waterbenders and they are now about to be trained and I assume it'll link into the story in that Paku's going to try and train them the northern way, where Katara wants to keep some of the southern style going, and that's going to create another kind of issue there. But uh, yeah, just setting up that more stuff like offices, town halls, things are more advanced than we initially thought. But Kelly, what are your thoughts on these two pages, packed with information? Yeah, a lot of stuff happens in these pages, and I do like them a lot, although that continuity error really did bother me. Like, it shouldn't have, but it did. Like, yeah, it's true, they said that they were engaged, not married in the show, but, like, the reaction is still, like, as if he had no idea that they got back together at all, and he, he just forgot after three years. <laughs> you know, that, that would have been kind of funny, too, if you think about it, if he just straight up forgot. Uh, but... No, um, I do really like it, although I do kind of sort of have a complaint, not really. I feel like we needed more time with Katara and Sokka alone with Grand Grand, like, in the sense that, like, yeah, the reunion was nice, they're hugging, and, and it's great, and they spoke for, like, a second before Paku came in. You know what mm. I mean? And then Paku's like, oh, hi, hello, how, how are you? Oh, by the way, we got married, and, like, and then they go straight into the Water Tribe training. It's like, it, my personal preference, I would have liked more time with just them with Grand Grand because it's their mm -hmm. grandmother, and then I feel like it was it came. I feel like they needed to get Paku in there because so much is happening in this book that they were like, quick, have a reunion with Grand Grand. Okay, now get to the story related stuff, and I kind of didn't like that. If you want me to be honest, I, I wanted a little bit more time with just the three of them. 
Um, but what are you going to do? Paku is also a really important part of Katara's life um, in the when she learned waterbending. So it's not like it's bad by any means. I'm not in any way disappointed or like angry. But at the same time, I'm like, you know what, Amy? I'm a little disappointed. That's a word I can use. But anyway, um, I really like uh, the mm-hmm. like how happy they are together, even though... In itself, this marriage is a continuity error that always bothered me about the show because it's like she left the Northern Triad because she didn't want to be for. Maybe she really did. You know what would be really interesting? If Connor really did love Paku but left anyway just to make a statement. That That's pro- probably what happened, and that's that's actually really crazy. Anyway, um, that was a really ominous comment that Paku made about um, saying, like, there are Southern... There are, like, Southern uh, benders now. It's like if you when you come by to... Um, yeah, it's it, that that's it's the interesting part. I'm what I'm guessing is that you know when the Northerners came or whatever they met Southerners or whatever, and it's been three years, so they probably have like two year olds plus they're the little little kids, the little babies that were there when Katara and Sokka like mm-hmm. just left the village. Yep. Maybe those ended up being waterbenders. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Which is crazy. Katara didn't even know that maybe some of the little kids that she was with ended up also being waterbenders. So to me, that 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 would be the interesting part. And then she like wouldn't know the whole time, and maybe she'll feel a bit of guilt like she left, and it's like oh she could have you know, help them or whatever, but who knows. Um, what I actually like about the scene was how, you know, they say all the things that they do, and, you know, Sokka never gets enough credit from Kana and Paku. Like, you ever think about it, they always mm-hmm. joke, like, it's like, oh, he's taller, take care of your sister, and Paku's always like, yes, okay, motivational bender. But I like how they actually bring up the day of Black Sun here. Yeah. Like, I really, because that doesn't, like, get talked about enough. Like, Sokka basically led an entire army and mm-hmm. took out the Fire Nation forces. So, like, to me, I really appreciated the mention of that. And, yeah, the whole office thing is like, oh, yeah, your dad has a giant office. And that was really crazy. So, I like the scene overall. Um, I actually like the, the when Paku's like, you repeating everything I say doesn't help anybody, young man. Because Sokka just keeps repeating everything. And, they, like, it, it, it's cute. It's funny to me. Um, it's a good scene. I personally would have wanted more time with Kana and just the kid. Maybe later there'll be a scene with Katara and Kana speaking about everything that's changed. But I want more Kana because I feel like like she was just kind of like shoved to the side for Paku. Mm, yeah. What, what about you, Greg? What are your thoughts on this uh, reunion with Grand Grand? Um, I thought it was pretty nice. I mean, it is, you know, kind of short here, but it is sort of very sweet. And I do like that they sort of explain, you know, Grand uh, Paku and kind of sort of, you know, their new relationship here, despite, you know, Sokka seemingly being, you know, overly excited, possibly maybe forgetting about sort of what happened here. But I don't know, I thought it was nice just to see them, you know, have a conversation in general, just these people that we've, you know, we've known for a long time and just to see them, you know, be reunited and, you know, hear about, you know, how the stories of these two have been, you know, told throughout sort of the the city now um, and how, you know, Paku's actually sort of tired of actually hearing them, I think is, you know, some nice little jokes that they sort of have here. So I really sort of, you know, overall, I, I enjoyed their sort of meeting back here and, you know, the whole reference back to Misty Pomelis, I thought was really nice too. Mm, yes. Um, but yeah, we, uh, move on to the next page. We find out that the big reveal that's coming here is why their father has an office is that he isn't just their local, the local chieftain anymore. He's been elected head chieftain of the entire Southern Water Tribe. Now, they must have thought that that was a reveal, but it's always been a thing that in the show they have never told us how the leadership structure of the South works. We know because uh, I think. Uh, Brian explained it to us prior to book two of Korra that the South had all these different chieftains that they elect for different sections of it. The problem obviously is that when we see the Southern Water Tribe there's only one tiny village and so there's only one local chieftain so it's it's just a kind of slightly confusing thing but uh, it's just getting across that in the South the chieftain is a kind of elected position in the north. It's a royal family line. That's why Katara and Sokka are not prince and princess. Um, but yeah, we, we arrive at his office. Katara's like, this office is so not dad. They arrive in and we see that there's two new carriages in the background. But first we have the reunion of uh, Katara and Sokka with their father. Obviously this hasn't been as long, but it's still basically since the start of the comics, you know, the end of the series more or less. It's been a while since they've seen their father as well. So we have uh, hugs all around, and uh, yeah, they're just like yeah, he he's fine with them being away for so long. You've you've been helping the Avatar to rebuild the world. I know from experience that rebuilding takes an awful lot of time. 
he then introduces our new characters. Uh, first up is Melina and then also Malik of the Northern Water Tribe. And he says that their construction crew is helping us with the Southern Reconstruction Project. And Melina says that we've actually spent more of our lives in the Earth Kingdom than the North Pole. But I guess once you're of the Northern Water Tribe, you're always of the Northern Water Tribe. And kind of laughs about it. Malik kind of freaks out. You know, he also considers them celebrities. They've known about them for a while. They've kind of welcomed them here. They're kind of happy to have the celebrities of Katara and Sokka there. And at this point, the uh, builders arrive back in, but we'll get to that in a minute. Let's focus on the reunion with Hakoda and then meeting Melina and Malik for the first time. So, um, Greg, what are your thoughts on this scene? Um, I thought this was nice. The whole family reunion scene, like, it sort of mirrors the other previous one. It's, it's nice to see, you know, Katara and Sokka sort of back with Hakoda and just, you know, all the, you know, the emotional bond that they all have with each other and, you know, just his, you know, his sort of excitement for seeing them, I think that comes across really cool. And then meeting our sort of new characters here, which we've known for a while now based off of this descriptions, I think we didn't know about, um... Malik until maybe the second book description, was that right? Um, yeah, second or third, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's nice to see them. Um, actually, that's kind of interesting. I thought maybe we would get introduced to him later just because of when we actually got his name, but it's nice to see them here in the beginning, just to see that they're builders here and they're, you know, from the Northern Water Tribe, but, you know, generally have been in the Earth Nation, so it's interesting just to see that. Um, so it's nice to see, I guess, sort of I guess northerners that aren't so maybe sort of indebted to sort of their sort of culture or their sort of way of life even though later scenes might you know sort of sway you sort of against that notion um but no i thought it was cool sort of meeting them i mean melina she seems i mean this is i guess for me was the part where i sort of thought that you know she seems really really sort of excited or overly sort of excited about sort of uh, the palace that she's sort of building for Hakoda and, you know, just sort of his sort of reactions to sort of her sort of comments sort of, you know, definitely leads me on towards the path of what we sort of see at the end of the book. So I don't know if that was sort of intentional that they sort of gave it away more or less at that point for me or if it just was supposed to be more subtle. Um, but no, I think it's definitely sort of cool seeing our new sort of characters and seeing the whole sketch of the possible new palace. Um, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that sort of works out with Sokka being obviously so forward and, you know, Katara being, you know, so sort of set against it. So it's interesting contrast that we have here. Mm, yeah, yeah. My, my initial questions with Melina are that, like, Okay, she's pretty enthusiastic. She's she and her and we later find out brother are the ones behind this kind of the construction project. Like they're organizing most of that along with Hakoda, so that's why they're there in the first place, and like not like Chief Arnook or anyone like that down there supporting it. Uh, I thought it was really interesting that they kind of set up this idea that the two of them have spent most of their lives in the Earth Kingdom and have been away from their own tribe and. Uh, I, I, that's just pretty interesting. I always, it, to me, came across like the North, especially in the like most recent, like since the Hundred Year War has been going on, that the North stayed in the North and they didn't really leave. So it's interesting finding out that people in or around Hakoda's age, you know, have left. We assume at a at a reasonably early age, lived most of their lives in the Earth Kingdom, kind of created this business and have returned and have this construction crew. It's it's interesting because we find out it, it's kind of half half and half water tribe half uh, earth kingdom uh with the as we see with the builders that we're introduced to um malik we don't get a lot on right now just with this scene just that he's kind of he seems to look into all of the celebrity stuff to do with the war the kind of news about that that's become history um but not a lot of like real character with him just yet but um kelly uh, what are your thoughts on this reunion with hakoda and then meeting our new characters yeah, um, it's really interesting. I agree. the The Earth Kingdom comment really stood out to me as well. I, I don't know what that's going to mean in the future, but to me, that kind of emphasizes how, for Melina, it doesn't really seem to be about like she doesn't really care about culture or care about like tradition. She just cares about like, you know, we can make things bigger and better that will show the other people that we matter or whatever like it's interesting she's interesting to me um but the reunion was really sweet it has probably been a really long time since he's seen him because like i said the comics so far and the way that they're being paced has probably been two years you know what i mean so it's been two years since he's seen their dead considering everything that happened in book three that is kind of crazy um so yeah no uh i'm glad that they finally like you know see him again and now they'll probably see him regularly which is great um 
And uh, yeah, you know, it's 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 interesting um, seeing Katara's reaction to all of this. Like, she, like, so, like to me, it's kind of interesting because um, she very much sees everything as being. It, it it doesn't just sound like a whole thing. She wants everything to be exactly the same as when she was a kid, but more that she sees people. She doesn't see the northern, uh, the southern tribe being as materialistic, and like, uh, you know this kind of way where it's like everything's fancy or everything's like she doesn't like the fact that everything's fancy and big and i guess i'm trying to figure out like what it is specifically about that that she doesn't like and didn't get that flashback later where she was like everything's like and then they go back to the the rift i think that was a flashback up but well, i'm getting it too ahead of myself um i like melina a lot uh in the sense that she's interesting i don't know what's going on with her i don't think she like like i don't know to me she's not what i expected i thought she would be like kind of more stern or whatever like like, this is how things need to be done or whatever but she's actually quite energetic about things same thing with the brother Malik even though we don't get a lot of him either Um, and Sokka kissing up to her was hilarious to me I think that was one of the funniest panels in the whole comic was in the middle of 28 which is like you don't you know you have you um you have not Sokka stop kissing up and then she's like well isn't a consultant just telling people what to do (laughs) and I was like okay that that's pretty funny um I, yeah, this is this is setting up a lot of stuff very quickly, and that's one of the things I like and don't like about this comic, in that it, maybe I do like it, I just don't know, it's, again, it feels so much like a part one, right, you know what I mean, like, 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 okay, let's establish everything that's going on, we have this, we have that, we have this, we have that, and it's like, whoa, okay, that's a lot of information very quickly, I'm glad to get it, but not a lot is happening at the same time, it's like, so much is happening, and nothing is happening at the same time with this part, and that's very strange to me. Um, and this is obviously one of those moments where a lot of pages are being taken up by character introductions, exposition, all these different things that I understand are necessary considering we're in a brand new world and brand new concepts. But I guess it just makes me more frustrated when we want to get to the actual like stuff happening later on in the book. So um, all good stuff for the most part. It's just, you know, it took me a second. I've read this book twice, right? Um, it took me a second read to appreciate it more. I do like it. But the first time I read it, I felt like I was chugging through exposition. I was like, okay, things are happening, things are happening. Um, Not that they weren't interesting things, but maybe things I couldn't quite grab onto until I read it a second time. That was my experience from it, mostly from these pages. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moving on to the next page, we get introduced to the builders. Their names are Noah, Kam, and Sunjay. Noah and Kam are waterbenders. Sunjay is an earthbender, uh, obviously getting that connection there. And they come in, there's obviously the initial kind of tension between them, Katara and Sokka. They think there's another fight about to happen, but very quickly we just find out that, like, okay, they're, they're Melina's crew, they calm things down, they should have had the fence up. Uh, and then they get to the idea, like, the big next upcoming construction project is going to be a new office uh, for the local government in the city, and because uh, they don't want it to just be in town hall. Uh, Katara brings up the point, it's just like, really you want a big fancy office you don't seem you're not a fancy kind of guy and he kind of gives this kind of ex- he tries to explain but kind of melina kind of comes in ahead of him and kind of gives the reason um and basically we get that what they're going to build is a palace for the southern water tribe uh, and they're kind of shocked by this Sokka's happy katara's like really and she goes around to kind of ask her father what th- what's up with this and He just says, I know Katara, I never thought I would have wanted to build something like this myself. It's Melina's idea, and I've come to see that it's a good one. So you can see that whatever relationship they have, Melina is kind of controlling it right now. And her perspective on it is that a palace commands respect. You see, it says to the world, look out, we're here, we're a people to be reckoned with. You need that here in the South more than you know. And Katara's like, what's that meant to mean? And Hakoda says... What Melina is trying to say here is if the Southern Water Tribe is going to start collaborating with more of the other nations, we need, we need to show them that we're equal partners. Um, and this is where kind of Melina asks uh, Sokka to have a consulting role with the crew here while they're going on about this. And we get the whole kissing up comment. Um, and then they basically just say, we're going to go to dinner to celebrate this. Katara wants to just kind of sleep because she's really tired, but Sokka gets them in- involved in this uh, going to to a dinner, um, and there's a bit of frustration there with Katara because she wants to rest just being recently home. Um, this is interesting because we get to see the blueprint of the palace. It ultimately doesn't look a ton like the actual palace that we later have in Korra, where she basically lives for like the like book four and stuff like that. Uh, 
it's got similarities, but it's not the exact same. But at the same time, we know at, at, at some point a palace is built in the south, at whatever point. But um, definitely this is an interesting idea. Melina is kind of, you know, kind of dominating the kind of discussions with her coda, but it doesn't seem like there's anything too evil or anything like that going on, just that her enthusiasm seems to kind of take over uh, Hakoda's leadership. Um, and then the other part is just that they want this palace to kind of make the South recognizable on a world stage, that they actually have a leader who's in a palace and not just a tribal chief, as we kind of get earlier on. And this comes back later on, this whole idea of how strong is the leader of the South uh, versus other nations. but. Some interesting stuff here for sure, but uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on this uh, kind of South building project, the palace and the whole leadership issue brought up here? Yeah, no, I think the whole, you know, idea of the palace seems, you know, pretty interesting. I mean, it seems like sort of the logical sort of progression of all of the the building that has been happening and, you know, just it coming from like a small sort of city to a large sort of village and, you know, Molina's sort of, you know, over, I don't know if it's over excitement, but just her general, I just, I guess, jubilance to this whole sort of project definitely, you know, seems I don't know, maybe almost over and above, um, but it's, it's nice to see how, you know, how, you know, her thoughts on the whole idea of, you know, the Southern Water Tribe and how they, you know, might be viewed on the world sort of, you know, scale here. So, and, you know, I, I think it's actually, you know, in some sense, it sort of makes sense as far as being sort of evil footing with the other sort of nations. Um, so it'll be interesting just to see, you know, I guess sort of how far along this sort of project actually goes and, you know, just meeting, you know, I guess sort of the builders and getting to understand them and, you know, how they hold. So I guess sort of make the comment of them being sort of artisans, not sort of fighters, I think is just interesting to note and just sort of the conflict that they have here and how they sort of diffuse that situation. And, you know, of course, them sort of going out to eat seems like a, a nice sort of capstone here, even though, you know, you can see that Qatar definitely would have uh, appreciated probably being with her sort of father alone with Sokka instead of, you know, with these two other people that she doesn't really know. But, you know, of course, Sokka is sort of all for food as usual. Mm, yeah, like, like, Katara kind of brings up the point that kind of, uh, I suppose Kelly was getting at a little bit earlier on, like Katara just wants like, I want some alone time at home with like my family to get to talk to Grand Grand some more, my father some more on her own, but they're immediately in, basically invited to this kind of business kind of get together type thing and she'd appreciate more kind of family time coming home because the big thing we know about the Water Tribe, especially the Southern one, is that they're very kind of family orientated and this stuff is sort of getting in the way, but uh, Kelly, uh, what are your thoughts on the, the big palace building project and then the whole idea of what that means for the southern leadership that's presented here? Right. Yeah. Sorry I got my pages a bit mixed up earlier. Um, I thought we were talking about something else earlier. I thought we were talking about the scenes we're now talking about now. So, like, I, I, I don't know how I did that, um, so I apologize for that. So basically a lot that I said earlier had to do with this part, but if you want, I'll be more specific on um, pages 32 and 33 right that's what we were talking about i don't know why i accidentally skipped over those okay anyway um yeah the palace this is interesting to me because um that palace doesn't look quite what we end up getting in chorus so obviously plans have changed or you know continuity from the book and the show who knows um and yeah like i said earlier you know katara being surprised by like how like fancy everything is being and how hakoda would agree to all of this and uh it, you know, you look at you, you look at the middle panel of 32, and you get kind of a sense of what could happen. Kind of a, you start. It's a hint at what you end up seeing at the end of the book, is what I'm saying, <laughs> in the sense um, uh, that you know, <laughs> Hakoda realized it might be a good idea. Um, but you know, like I said earlier, again, I, I everything I was talking about earlier, I was talking about these scenes, so I apologize for that. I don't really know what else to say. I got myself jumbled. So. Um, yeah, you know, I really, the bottom of 32 is very interesting in that she's very energetic about it, but she doesn't realize, maybe she doesn't realize how insulting she's being, yeah. because Katara's and right in saying, what's that supposed to mean? Like, you know, a palace commands respect, um, you know, look out, here we are, we're people to be reckoned with, and you, you, and you need that here in the South more than you know. It's like, it's, act, they're very, like, elitist, and, like, saying, like, you know, the Southern is so, like, 
destroyed. It's like, we need to come in and help you. Um, but like, we're better than you. And I, I don't know if they're doing that. I, I don't know. I, to me, Melina doesn't seem like she's doing that on purpose. And that's what kind of makes her more interesting to me. If she just turned out to be like evil the whole time, I, that would actually kind of bother me. To me, it seems like there's a, it, it's, a, it's a gray area of extremists on both sides with the rebellion that we see or later. And then with Melina here. So I don't know. Um, yeah, and then you know they all go, they all just you know ignore the problems that they have and they go out to dinner. You know what I mean? Like it's like let's just go to dinner. And like you said, Morgan, it's like Katara just wants time to talk about these things. You know that we've had a long day. We should talk. And they're just like, no, let's keep it going, keep going. And what I'm getting at that's very interesting here is kind of what I was worried about when we getting when we're getting into this book is that Sokka and Katara are on very opposite ends here. You know what I mean? Like throughout the whole thing, Sokka's not even listening to Katara. A lot of people aren't listening to Katara right now, which is very interesting. And I feel like that's why she's going to end up doing extreme things is because no one's listening to her, including her brother, So, which later there's another scene that involves that. So I like this a lot. I like the setup. I'm sorry for getting the pages mixed up. Like I, everything I said, everything I've been talking about is just the overall of what's going on in this office. Do you know what I mean? Like in general, not I. I yeah, sorry about that. I was a little confused. So, mm -hmm. so uh, next scene is that we move into the restaurant. So we find out in the bottom of 34 that the restaurant is called The Two Fishes Northern Cuisine. So I think it's actually interesting that um, Melina immediately brings them to a northern restaurant that has northern food. Um, as opposed to like, oh, you've just returned home to the south. Like, would you not want your own food? She's just bringing them out for northern food, even though they've been there. Uh, but um, at this uh, meeting... We, we just have them kind of talking and um, Melina talks about how she's had a hard time with southern cooking and she says I mean it's good and all but and it's so close to northern food it just tastes a bit off uh, you know and Katara's like off and she she says no offense and Sokka says none taken but Katara's like speak for yourself and I think it's an interesting scene because it it shows that Melina's like Oh, southern food is just um, s uh, southern food is just northern food off by a couple of degrees. Like it's not southern food; it's northern food that is not right, and that's a, that's the kind of problem that we have here with Melina. I, I agree; she doesn't really. I don't think she's meaning to come across this way, but she ends up coming across like, "Oh, us civilized people up in the north like eat this type of food. You, you southerners have you haven't done it right." And I think that's the problem, that they're not respecting that the South formed for a reason and stuff like that and is kind of off. Um, but yeah, we continue on. Two little kids enter the restaurant and kind of begin to approach them. We get this conversation about food, which could be more meaningful. Uh, Hakoda says to Sokka, uh, the differences between Northern and Southern cooking, they don't mean anything to you, Sokka. And he's like, nope, food is food to me as long as there's meat involved. Uh, then they begin to talk and one of these kids spills food on the table. The other uh, kid grabs the briefcase, which has the uh, plans for the palace in it, and uh, runs off. Uh, we get a brief action scene as Melina uses her water bending to kind of slip up the kid, but um, the other kid throws a kind of pot at Melina. She falls over, hits her head, basically is knocked out against the table, uh, and Malik and Hakoda rush over to help her as. Sokka and Katara go in pursuit of the two kids who kind of flee off on a kind of snowmobile type thing. So uh, lots of little stuff happens here, some little kind of north versus south stuff, uh, and then the, the actual theft happens. But um, Greg, what are your thoughts here? Some interesting stuff with Melina for sure. Um, yeah, no, it definitely is sort of interesting with Melina and, you know, how she doesn't seem sort of like, you know, I guess sort of malicious in any of her sort of statements here, but she definitely, you know, has her own opinions, definitely, you know, is, you know, has, uh, she definitely has, you know, the North, the Northern sort of ideal on sort of things and sort of, you know, how the world sort of works. Um, you can see that from this sort of part and the previous sort of pages here. So you can definitely tell that even if she has spent most of her time in the Earth Kingdom, she definitely has, you know, ideals that lead her towards more the Northern sort of way of thinking rather than the Southern. So it's interesting to see how she sort of brings that to sort Sort of, I guess, sort of this construction project and how that sort of has um has sort of changed, I guess, possibly sort of Hakoda's sort of thinking here. But you know, overall, I think it's a cool sort of scene, just seeing them all sort of eat together here, even if it isn't so, you know, as intimate as Katara would have hoped for with just her sort of father, maybe you know, 
possibly in sort of Grand Grand's village here. But, you know, leading up to the whole sort of, I guess, the first part of our sort of action scene here is it's interesting just to see. I mean, you can tell, you know, from the page before that something is going to sort of go down here. So it's, it's interesting just to see how these, I guess, sort of turn events play up. And, you know, the whole fact that he was so sort of set on not sort of leaving his briefcase in sort of the office, which, you know, ideally, you know, you would think would be sort of secure and sort of, you know, an official sort of office, you know, leads you to believe that, you know, there definitely is, you know, something, you know, possibly bigger going on. So it's, I guess it's a nice little bit of sort of foreshadow here. But, um, no, I think it's interesting just to see how this, you know, the scene sort of begins with the whole sort of a chase scene and to see that Melina is actually sort of a waterbender. Mm, yeah, I suppose on that point of her being a waterbender, I, th I think that's pretty interesting. If she's, if she's a woman from the north. And she, what's what's what she does here seems to be more of a combat-based uh, ability. Mm. In that, as far as we're aware, the people in the north, the women, are only trained in healing. It doesn't seem like they're ever really trained to use water like this. Now, we don't obviously know if this means she's super combat-focused or what. It just kind of highlights that either she's done some training on her own to be able to defend herself using her bending, or being around the Earth Kingdom has allowed her to maybe come into contact with um, the Foggy Swamp tribe and maybe learn some water bending from them, or maybe things have changed in the north and she's learned some stuff given the changes that Katara has made. Uh, I don't I don't know if it's maybe just a slight continuity moment where they're just like, oh, we'll just have Melina do this move, and they didn't really think about like she's a woman from the north, so she might not be able to do this or not. But um, it is an interesting point if they ever delve deeper into the backstory of Melina and Malik and what how her skills in waterbending are but um, definitely an interesting scene but uh, Kelly uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, sequence in the restaurant? I actually really like this scene a lot because I feel like the entire conversation that they have at their table is very much foreshadowing to their future actions and their opinions on the situation um in in the like I'm almost everything they talk about in the sense that Sokka is very content um Melina is unintentionally um not knowing the like to me actually what she says is very interesting because they mentioned how she grew up mostly in the Earth Kingdom, right? And how most of her life she was in the Earth Kingdom. So she remembers the Northern Water Tribe, of course, and, and cares so much for the Northern Water Tribe. And but and she says here, it's good and all, but it's so close to Northern food that everything just tastes a little bit off. Like, to me, what I'm gathering here is that Melina doesn't even understand that the Southern and the Northern are different for a reason. You know what I mean? In that, like, in that there's really... She doesn't know a lot about that because she's more rooted in Earth Kingdom not customs but like earth kingdom like mindset you know what i mean so mm. she she wants to believe that like you know oh, okay so the southern water tribe is like a tribe that was destroyed we need to build it back up to how it should be which is the northern water tribe which is where i grew up you know what i mean which and I, to me that's to me that's saying like she wants to genuinely help but she thinks she's doing good when she's actually think she's just trying to make things how she remembered it how she remembered the Northern Water Tribe and how she cares for it. And to me, that that's a very interesting concept that I want to see them explore, especially since what you mentioned, Morgan, and that she used a combat move. Mm -hmm. So either that was a bad continuity error, which honestly, considering the, 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 Mary thing, the married thing earlier, that I feel like that's unfortunately the case, but it could be a thing where she learned some combat skills in the Earth Kingdom somehow. You know what I mean? I don't know how. Maybe you said Foggy Swamp style. I have no idea. Um, but um, then we get later on, where Hakoda, like, you know, is talking to Sokka, and it's like, oh, you just, like, you know, you never cared about the differences between Northern and Southern, you just care about food, you know what I mean? He's like, yep, I just, I'm the, uh, that's the kind of person that I am, you know what I mean? And that's fine, but, you know, it also kind of, dis not disrespects, but, like, it's a very different way of thinking than Kantara and people who care about their culture and everything like that. But also, <laughs> again, with the end of the book, it's kind of a really good hint at that as well. Like, Hakoda bringing that up, I feel like that's also kind of, not foreshadow. maybe it is foreshadowing a little bit, but very, very, very subtle foreshadowing, that you wouldn't have been able to pick up unless you read this book again, you know what I mean? Um, and then you have the brother, who's like, well, I actually disagree, I love this other water tribe stuff down here, which, if I don't remember, you're gonna have to remind me what the description of the second book was. Because um, I forgot, but it had something to do with the brother. Yeah, it, it, in the, I think it's a part three description. It says something like, oh. her brother comes out to, um, like, dis to like put her reputation up in the air or something like that. Like, he says something that kind of 
implicates Melina in something or, or something like that. I think that's roughly the so. Kind of, yeah, I think we're gonna get some that's also foreshadowing to disagreements between them. Do you know what I mean with mm. the, the brother and the sister here, Melina and Malik, which that'll be very interesting as well. The whole thing I felt like was really good. The whole dinner scene I felt like was really good foreshadowing to the themes and the and the events that take place throughout the rest of the book, which I really, really like. And then you have this cool action scene where these kids take the briefcase. And I didn't understand what happened with Melina. Thank you for pointing out that she hit her head on a desk. Mm. I thought she just fell over because a pot hit her back. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, it's a pot. It would hurt, but it would knock her out. And I didn't realize that she slipped and hit her head on the desk and it. I, I didn't that didn't come across to me in the animation until you told me um so yeah this is a cool scene and stuff but i just i wanted to be detailed with that dinner scene because i feel mm, like a yeah. lot of it was foreshadowing mm, yeah yeah definitely like malik is definitely given the description we kind of have of him later from the part two and three descriptions and the fact that you know he's so protective of the briefcase like i was almost expecting something like when like they get the briefcase back they open it up and there's more in there than just the palace blueprints or something like that like <laughs> i'm almost expecting that to be something that happens that he may be the kind of bad side of them even though he's coming across super nice and melina is actually this there's, there's, apart from a little mm. bit of not, not understanding the mm. south is actually fairly okay but uh yeah the interesting sound effect of Kunk as she hits her head is interesting. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was. It's a comic book, so it's always interesting to get those sound effects. But uh, yeah, we move back to the action scene from here on. So how Sokka and Katara go about chasing these kids on a snowmobile is that Katara makes a a sled out of ice snow. Uh, they get on together and go down the mountain after them. She's using water bending to obviously help them kind of catch up with a motorized vehicle. Um, and they're really kind of going for it. They go off a giant ramp and Sokka's like, no, the impact of going off this thing is going to break the whole sled. And Katara's just like, I knew that was going to happen. I can just make another one really simply. And this water bends another one there. Uh, so you see like Sokka's kind of analyzing the situation and Katara's like, no, I'm, I'm battling here. I know exactly what I'm doing. She makes another one, catches up with them. Sokka makes the great comment of, my sister here is probably the best waterbender in the world. So maybe give up now. And the kids are kind of, freaking out as they kind of uh, get away temporarily but uh, they manage to kind of roughly catch up with them and they they end up getting to the place where the crashed uh, Fire Nation ship is from the obviously attack of the uh, Azulon's uh, attack that he ordered on the south and basically the situation that led to all of the waterbenders being captured I believe this is the Hama flashback we see the, the southern waterbenders actually freeze the ship into this position they call it the haunted uh, shipwreck and we also get the reference of it's not haunted ang and i went in there once and we get the oh Sakura finally remembers he was the one who thought ang was the spy and um, uh, we get that little joke come up again and they <clears throat> they walk into the ship because this is where the kids have fled off to and this is where things start to get a, a lot more kind of interesting and in that like oh we're, we're going back to the ship for some reason but uh, Kelly, uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, the rest of this action scene and arriving at the the haunted shipwreck? I like the scene a lot. This is where things actually started to pick up for me because even though it's just one big action sequence, it, it was actually a fun one. Not to say that these comic ones like are like not like good or anything, but like at least with this, there was a lot of because there's motion to it instead of just you know fire blast or like jumping over fire blast or like the, the stillness of it. You get a sense that like this is a like there's motion here you know what i mean that there's a chase going on and i think that for some reason that translates better into this comic or in comics in general so um or at least for these avatar comics um so i really like this a lot um the scene was very funny but also very serious at the same time um Sokka thinking you know if we fall from here this thing's gonna break you know logically you know like you said Sokka thinks very logically uh but Katara's like look I know I'm in my element I know what I'm doing just trust me it reminded me a lot of the drill <laughs> where she was like pushing up the water into the, the drill and he's like you can do it just if you keep doing that and she's like shut up you know what I mean um he very much you know he obviously cares but like you know he doesn't trust Katara half the time and um that shot of like when they fly off the cliff and Katara is like oh I'm bracing for impact and Sokka is like my hands are freezing while I'm holding on it's like I don't know why but that made me laugh a lot like that's that's just a really funny panel to me and you know she makes another one another sled which is great um and then Sokka boasting and then you know he was just complaining but now he's boasting about his sister it's like this is the best waterbender in the world you can't stop us and just this whole part was very well animated and you 
it's like, you know how, again, action doesn't come across that amazingly well in these comics, not badly by any means, but you never really get a sense of adrenaline or like, whoa, this is what's happening. I feel like that hit more with this comic, like, you know, in the sense of like the motion and the speed and like what was going on physically in the space. Because sometimes when you have action between benders fighting each other, you can't quite get a handle on what's going on with the space or where people are in the area. But like this... I very much got an idea of what was going on. I imagined it as if I was watching the show, and it it reminded me. I don't know. It just it kind of reminded me of a you know book two of Korra when they went out into the to the look for the the, the Northern Lights or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it was just it was it was a lot of fun, and I liked the scene a lot. And then they go to the ship. They go back to the ship, mm-hmm. the 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 one that that has so much history behind it in this show, and they that's so cool. I, I'm assuming we're stopping at fifty, which is mm-hmm. which uh, yeah. Um, that was really funny that he's like, oh yeah, now I remember. I thought I, was, I thought he was the spy for the Fire Navy. Uh, that's too good, too good. This is a great part. I like mm. this part a lot. Mm. What about you, Greg? No, I I agree. I really sort of enjoyed this part. I think the the point that Kelly mentioned about motion is something that I really sort of keyed in on well, which is you know it's it's easier to do with sort of vehicles in general, just because you know they have to be moving. There's no point of them being sort of static. Um, so you know these panels definitely sort of convey that motion, which is something that you know if you remember watching the show, you're sort of very sort of fond of. Like you can remember sort of you know, Ang um sort of being in sort of um the the you know the um, the male sort of uh you know, sort of sleds through their whole system. Um, so, you know, it's very sort of reminiscent of that. Um, you know, even the whole idea of, you know, Katara sort of making the stairs sort of reminds me of Toph when she sort of, you know, took the stairs down and uh, Bossing say. So, you know, there's a lot of little nice sort of callbacks here as well as just general interactions with, um, you know, with Katara and Sokka here that I sort of really enjoy. Just him sort of, him doing his normal thing of bragging and just sort of, you know, trying to analyze the situation, I think was, you know, conveyed really well in the sequence. I mean, there's not sort of like a whole lot of dialogue here, but, you know, it's placed very well well and it works for sort of what they're trying to do here so i i, I agree i really enjoyed these uh scenes uh, the only other point i have about this scene is um snowmobiles that seems a little too advanced technology at this stage i get that we're at the point where we have like forklifts now but how do <coughs> two kids that are working for the southern side of this issue have a snowmobile yeah, I, I noticed that too. It this seems sort of odd. Like the whole idea of there being sort of a, a snowmobile didn't throw me off so much because, you know, we've seen the Fire Nation with their sort of, you know, their technology and their, you know, equivalent over water. So it's not sort of like too out there. It's not like they jump like, you know, 20 years into the future or anything, but it does seem kind of odd that knowing that these people are sort of against, you know, sort of the change in the nation that they sort of would have, you know, probably one of the more sort of advanced things in the southern um, water tribe. So it does seem to be sort of, I guess, a little bit of a conflict of interest there, possibly. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure how they'll, you know, sort of possibly sort of explain that or even if it's sort of worth it, but it is definitely something to note. Yeah, like yeah that's like, a good point. Oh, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Kelly, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add my thoughts on that. Um, You know, that's a good point. I didn't really think about it. I'll say it doesn't seem that advanced to me except for one aspect of it. There's a light on the front. There's, like, there's like a light on the front, which means, like, you know, electricity and, like, motors. And the, 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 the Fire Nation had that with, like, steam and everything. But have we actually seen, like, working electrical lights in this time period yet? Or is that just a Korra thing? Unless I'm crazy and there was a time and I don't remember it. Because that's, that's my problem, is the fact that there's, like, a light in the front of it. I'm like, that's that's very modern. Um, but it's not, but to me, um, I just thought they stole that. Like, I didn't think that was theirs. I thought they just yeah. stole Melina and Malik's. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, like uh, they used theirs to get away so that they wouldn't be able to chase after them if anything happened. Uh, but even still, that is a little bit o- over-advanced. Not crazy over-advanced, but a little bit over-advanced. And now that you say that, it does kind of bother me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, well. It, it, that's why it reminded me of the book two, uh, the Northern Lights, because they had snowmobile in it. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just that when we were actually in the Northern Water Tribe, they didn't have any technology really either. Like they they were much more like built up. It was a giant city, but there was no real technology as such there. And because they're so traditional, I, I, we we always always had the speculation like if we ever went to the north, would they have embraced technology like Republic City and. I think most of us came to the conclusion that they probably wouldn't or would only use minor technology. So I'd, I'd probably agree with Kelly that um, Melina and Malik coming from more like uh, Earth Kingdom kind of areas 
would have kind of learned about technology maybe there uh, because of the war advancing technology and use it and obviously it's the advancements since then over the course of the comics we've seen more technology and it would make sense it's roughly starting to come out more but I assume we'll probably have to get some sort of an explanation that like the southerners have been stealing stuff from Melina's crew and that's why we have this situation but uh, yeah definitely just there's a few little moments in the book where you're just like have they fully thought through the situation that we're in right now with regards to technology the traditions of the north uh, female waterbenders from the north and stuff like that um but we'll continue so they walk into the haunted shipwreck as they're calling it and they're kind of like okay there's strip wires booby traps we need to watch out uh Sokka's following some footprints and uh accidentally comes across a kind of trip wire hanging down he triggers it with his head basically he falls through a hole but uh, he basically calls Katara down that this is actually the way they're meant to go so Katara jumps down and they're immediately greeted by Gilak of the Southern Water Tribe and he says you are you are Sokka and Katara children of Hakoda and so this is the guy we heard about from the part two and three um, descriptions uh, and it more or less spoiled the general like I suppose impression he was going to leave on us but um, I still think it was interesting to kind of meet him in this way that he's he's got this group under here under the the shipwreck but uh, to get a little bit further in so we can discuss more about him um, he says that uh, he's actually met Sokka before your father and I were brothers in arms we traveled the world together fighting the world shoulder to sh fighting the fire nation shoulder to shoulder Hakoda is a hero of the south and the two of you, uh, as are the two of you and they're kind of talk about you know the briefcase was stolen we'd like it returned and these kids need to be brought in because they injured someone and he kind of calls them in and we find out that there's also a bunch of southerners basically living here uh, in more kind of traditional style he talks about his second in command his name is Thud and he keeps the old stories of their people alive and uh, he just talks about how it's very important for them to keep these stories and the the history of the south alive but um, I, I, I just really like the the idea that okay this is basically one of the people who Hakoda commanded he was probably one of the off-screen warriors the few times we got to see Hakoda's group I think that's a pretty cool way to do things but um Greg uh, what are your thoughts on uh, getting to meet Gilak here um yeah no it is sort of interesting to sort of meet him for the first time and I almost sort of forgot about sort of you know the descriptions that we had before so you know I didn't really think about too much about sort of what his sort of future involvement is um now of course I'm thinking about that but I don't know it's, it's interesting just to meet him and see his sort of personality and you know how you know initially like you know sort of most sort of you know possible sort of uh villains or whatever you know he doesn't seem so sort of off-putting he seems like you know some other sort of jovial sort of older a man who you know used to fight in the war and you know although he does you know sort of kind of uh ignore their sort of questions about the briefcase briefcase and the kids you know you can see you know that you know he's generally sort of uh, a nicer i guess sort of type of guy at least in general is with all these sort of people being down here and sort of you know trying to keep i guess sort of more traditional ways of living you know sort of alive here but it's interesting just to see you know how i guess sort of katara and saka sort of react to this and you know in the coming pages you know how that sort of you know gets skewed in a different way other than their first sort of initial um impressions here yeah especially when he says the, the word patriots i was but that's the first kind of hint her just like <laughs> oh that word whenever you bring that up it's, it's usually never the the most amazing thing but uh kelly your, what are your first impressions of meeting gilak here yeah, this is really interesting to me. Um, particularly the backstory here, which I'm trying to understand with the history of the Southern Tribe and the tribes in general. Um, you know, earlier you mentioned that Brian once explained that there was technically more than one tribe or something, and there was, like, multiple ones, and, like, the one we only saw was the, you know, was, was Katara Zaka's or whatever. Um, so to me, it's a little weird that they wouldn't know who this guy is because they were, what, what Zaka was lit like? eight not ten or whatever when 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 hakoda left and like maybe he just forgot you know that's true he was a kid you know what i mean but uh you feel like he would remember the men who left his village you know what i mean and he grew up with these people so i'm thinking maybe gilak is from another village or something you know what i mean like because like how would they like not know who he is if he's a southerner that's the one thing about this comic that kind of confuses me is that there's so many southerners in here in so many places but we only saw so few of them in 
the in the first two episodes, at least of the women, and then we know the men went out to war. So wouldn't Katara and Sokka know basically everybody, unless there were other tribes around? And to, I'm gonna stop talking about this because um, it it's very confusing to me. But um, I like this is a very interesting introduction to him because he seems so like kind and warm, but then you realize his true intentions as the conversation goes on, which is really interesting to me. The very contrasting of personality and intention. Um, and, you know, how serious Katara and Sokka here are, like, you know, somebody was hurt, we need to take care of this or whatever. Um, yeah, but I, I like the setting up, I like the establishing shots here of the, in, on page, um, oh, I don't know what page is this, okay, I don't know, um, of uh, the, the Southerners listening to this old man's stories and, like, how it feels very camaraderie here but at the same time it's the the intentions and the extremity hasn't been shown just yet so you like ease into it during the conversation which is interesting um but yeah Gilak is going to be a uh, quite a character he's like yeah okay what he believes in actually makes a lot of sense and you understand where he and Qatar are coming from but he's much more uh uh, militaristic about it, which is really interesting. You got the weapons in the corner and everything. So, yeah, we'll talk more about this as we continue discussing, because there's a lot, a lot yeah. of interesting political talking here. Yeah, the, these next two pages, 58 and 59, we'll spend a bit of time on. Um, so, I'll, I'll read this out. Um, the next thing he says is, while traveling the world with your father, I realized that the strong cultures, the Fire Nation and the Earth Kingdom, value power over cooperation. Their societies are organized around a single powerful leader, and in their dealings with other nations, they think first about power. We in the South here have always been egalitarian. Our chieftains see each other as brothers and sisters, and we've paid dearly for it. Look at the Air Nomads. They were the most egalitarian of all, and they've been wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, Sokka Katara, I, I deeply admire your father. When I heard that, they had accepted, that he had accepted the position of head chieftain, I couldn't have been happier. I thought he'd be the powerful leader we've needed all along. But then he began inviting foreigners onto our shores, including those cowards from the north. And they kind of talk about, hey, watch how you talk about our sister tribe. And he says, uh, for almost a century, uh, we've, we southerners sacrifi uh, sacrificed wave after wave of men to fight the Fire Nation, while the northerners just hid behind their icy wall. Does that sound like a sister tribe to you, Sokka? Um, your father is too idealistic to realize that the other nations think nothing, uh, think of nothing but power. Uh, true cooperation is impossible. For the South to grow strong again, all foreigners' presence must be eradicated, especially the North. Such an action will most likely lead to war, so we've gathered here to prepare. Um, and Katara talks about my brother and I have traveled the world too, uh, and from what we've seen, you're wrong. Uh, where the Fire Nation colonies used to be, uh, people from the Earth Kingdom and Fire Nation are working together to build a new society, and even Melina and Malik's crew punches the wall, and we'll get into what happens after that. This first section here is really interesting. He gives his opinion on the leaders of the world, basically. He admires the Earth Kingdom and the Fire Lord positions from the, the Earth Kingdom and Fire Nation. Um, and he basically sees the other two nations, Air Nomads and uh, Southern Water Tribe especially, as you know they, they've kind of paid for not having an all-powerful ruler. They've paid for trying to be fairer with their leadership posi positions. Um, I think it's really interesting to try and interpret Katara's facial expression to when she reacts to what he says about the air nomads because there's a point a few pages on from this where the air ang air nomad comes up again and she kind of thinks about it but it's just very very interesting that he he's completely obsessed with the south and is like talking about stuff like eradicating people who aren't from the south getting rid of the northerners especially and I think the, it's kind of understandable the position that he takes and that he brings up the whole idea of like for a, a hundred years basically the tribes have been separated. The southern tribe took all of the damage because the Fire Nation couldn't get, get near the north. Um, they've suffered, the other tribe didn't even attempt to help and we haven't had an explanation really for that as well. Um, and uh, they tried to bring up the stuff from the promise, the nations beginning to come together but obviously from his perspective, it's just a very simple thing of the North have never helped us, now they're coming in and taking over. And uh, he doesn't like that and is preparing for war because he feels so strongly about it. Um, uh, it he feels a little bit like a Korra villain here, where he has a good ideal at a base level, but he's taken it way too far. But uh, uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on kind of 
I suppose a Gilak's ideology here. Yeah, no, it, it definitely does have, you know, reminiscence of sort of core villains where, you know, his general idea and his sort of, you know, his concepts sort of, you know, they make sense of, you know, why the other nations are better than, you know, sort of Southern Warlord tribe and why they have sort of suffered so far. But, you know, like most people in this sort of position, you know, they tend to take things to sort of extremes here. I mean, the fact that he says, you know, right here in the beginning that, you know, he knows that this will probably sort of lead to war, um, you know, speaks to, you know, how far he's sort of willing to take and, you know, just on the last sort of page we see of him just sort of you know with his fist sort of cracking the wall you can tell that you know at this point you know he's obviously you know has gone over the edge and you know has little chance of sort of being sort of reasoning with even with you know Qatar sort of explaining how you know new nations are sort of being brought together and how you know people are trying to build sort of new societies but you know it definitely seems like Gilak here just you know he won't sort of stand with it he's seen too much sort of strife in his you know life being actually sort of in the war that, you know, he can't really accept sort of anything different here. So it's interesting just to see, you know, his sort of perspective here and how this will probably lead, you know, possibly to, you know, another civil war, which is, you know, something that we have sort of seen before, but this is, you know, even within the own sort of Southern Water Tribe, not necessarily between the North and the South, you know, yet at least. Um, so it's definitely sort of, you know, an interesting sort of thing that they have sort of going here. Nothing sort of, I guess, sort of too sort of crazy here, but, you know, it could lead to something being really interesting later on. I do find it interesting, though, that Gilak and Melina kind of are going for a similar goal in the end. It's to try and get the leader of the South as a position respected by the world. Now, obviously, they approach that in slightly different ways. Melina thinks just having a palace and being more kind of out there to the world is going to help that. Whereas um, Gilak wanted, you know, Hakoda to really embrace the tribal aspect, head chieftain, you know, that sort of thing, uniting the tribes together. Um, but fundamentally a similar uh, issue at a base level. So that's interesting. But uh, Kelly, uh, what are your thoughts on his uh, ideologies as he's presented here in the first two pages? It's really fascinating to me because... It feels like an ideology that actually makes a lot of sense, but but at the same time, like, it's contradicting to what he believes in, in the sense that, like, I, I don't know, like, it's interesting to me. He wants the Southern traditions to be the same, and he wants everyone to stick together and be Southern or whatever, but then he admits to the fact that so the South has always been illeg illegalitarian, egalitarian, whatever the term is, but at, he's saying that should no longer be a part of our society. We need to, we, we, we need to have power to be respected. He's, he's, it's almost like, it, it, it's, it's, it's a weird analogy, but it's almost as if the, 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 you know, the world has bullied them, which is true. The Northern Water Tribe didn't help them with the Fire Nation. They were eradicated. No one cared. And yet, the, and yet the Northern Water Tribe and people still expect this cooperation between the two when the South rightfully feel very hurt over the Northern's actions towards them. You know what I mean? And, and, and for all of history, ha, ha, they split for a reason. You know what I mean? So, like, it's you understand where he's coming from, that everything they believed in has been... Dis, dis, uh, disrespected or disregarded and now he feels like he needs to just we need to get this foreign stuff out of here in order to create ourselves an identity because we don't have any because everyone's trying to rebuild this for us but at the same time your identity involves egalitarianism <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's such a weird situation and it's fascinating to me this is one of the more interesting conflicts I think I've seen in the whole Avatar universe in my opinion because you know, Katara brings up the point of, you know, people can work together. You can't separate people like this. And it brings, it brings you back to the guru where he's like, we're all one people. But at the same time, you understand the strife and the hardships and the wrong, how wrong the Southern tribe feel. You know what I mean? Like how 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 they feel about the situation. And he, he felt as though Hakoda didn't bring together the Southern water tribe. He's just bringing together anybody they can to to make themselves look better. And like you said, Malik and, um, what's his name? Uh, Melina Mal and Malik. Melina and Malik. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, Gal right, that's right, that's right. <sighs> Shoot, no, Melina and the guy who they're talking to right now. Oh, Gilak. Gilak, okay. Melina and Gilak, like you said, have similar concepts. They want to be respected with power, but Melina thinks it has to be through having these big palaces and being known by everybody. This is, uh, but being known by everybody, um... Uh, that we're able to do these things, but 
with him, it's like, no, we have to do that by being separate. You know what I mean? By being separated and, and then we'll be powerful. It's like they see power in two different lights. They see power as, um, they're, it's weird because they're so similar and so different. I think, and I think that's going to come into play in the third part where like, it's like what both of you guys want are actually really similar and you don't realize it. You know what I mean? And Sokka's reaction here is also kind of interesting to me as well. You know, um, in the sense that like he, you know, he's actually defending the sister tribe, but you know, the next, to me, the most interesting panel of this whole thing is for almost a century, we Southerners sacrificed have um, Mm. wave after wave of men to fight the fire nation while your Northerners just hid behind icy walls. It's like, yeah that's pretty true (laughs) you know what i mean it's like how how do we really like it's it's a sense of betrayal that's understandable but there needs to be conversation and forgiveness that they're forgetting about you know what i mean maybe there was a reason maybe there was a genuine reason the northern water tribe and we don't know that yet you know what i mean we don't know what it is and maybe we'll learn maybe we won't learn but it's this whole thing is super interesting to me and i really really like it a lot and we're gonna obviously get more into it as it goes on um but it's interesting to see Katara also be like, wait, no, no, no. But, you know, you're wrong. We can work together. Meanwhile, she's also on the inside feeling like she she's trying to find compromise within herself and with him because she actually agrees with him in most parts. But she's like, it's not impossible. We don't need war. I don't want a war. But she wants change. She doesn't want what Mali- Mal- Malina is doing. So oh, it's so interesting. Sorry. This is like the this is like I said, it feels like a lot of exposition. But then the second half of the book, gets so interesting. And then it just ends. And you're like, mm. oh, no. So, yeah, that's how I feel. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I suppose for me, the other thing is just that he obviously mentions the Air Nomads uh, as a similar thing. And I suppose the potential of what, what could happen to the South, where like right now, Ang. Ang, Appa, and Momo are like all that's basically left of the Air Nomads, and if the North continue as they're going and they make a southern, the Northern Palace, nothing will be left of the Southern culture. And I suppose at some point, at least we pretty much know this series is going to, I believe, explore the the history of the details of how the South actually formed by separating from the North in the first place, and that will probably explain a few more things to us because like right now we're just assuming it's like the basic they left because they didn't like as much tradition so they formed a more simplistic tribal culture and it's clear that the the two cultures of the world that had the most kind of reclusive you know to themselves air nomads and southern water tribe they're the ones who've suffered most because they not a lot of people know about them is it okay if we get involved with them and we kind of see what's happening here but um next page he continues to get more and more angry and he talks about how um you will kindly not mention the names of those two again the the city they're building is a betrayal of who we are the buildings the way they're pushing us to live the they're making us into a cheap imitation of the northern water tribe you know the northerners have always considered us savages now's their chance to impose their version of civilization on us um Sokka really wants to get out of there because he's getting unhinged, but uh, Katara wants to wait to see what he has to say. And he says, I believe their true intentions are far more nefarious. Uh, What we've seen is just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, he says, which is why you sent your spies to steal Malik's briefcase so that you could take a look at the documents inside. And he says, that's right, Sokka, so you understand me. And um, Katara just says, we're not leaving without the briefcase or those two spies. And he wants to help them see the truth. And he says, uh, Sokka says, our father doesn't need our help because he already sees the truth. And at this point, uh, Gilak just grabs uh, Sokka, puts a knife through his throat and is like, you can't leave uh, until I change your mind about this. Katara, though, uses her waterbending to obviously help things out. She she and Sokka together basically temporarily get away from Gilak and we get into a chase scene here and a bit of an action scene. But um, uh, Kelly, what are your thoughts on this second half of what Gil has to say? Um, yeah, uh, again, very interesting. Um, uh, you know, he, he he has a right to feel a little bit concerned, saying, you know, I feel like their true intentions are more nefarious than we've seen, um, which, you know, we were discussing earlier. Maybe it's um, Malik's intentions that are more nefarious, possibly as a plot twist, you know what I mean? And Melina really does, even though Melina seems like she's the one that was bees being more separate i don't know like to me that's kind of good foreshadowing and to, that's my prediction anyway that malik's the brother's going to end up being the one that's actually more nefarious i guess um and it's you know he he's recognizing that the northern water tribe has never treated them well 
You know what I mean? And it's reflecting onto what the kind of things Molina says. Like, you know, not that you, it's like more than you know, or, you know, Southern food is a bit off. Like comments like that are what makes the Southern be like, you think we're savages. We, you think that we, you know, we're not as good as you, that we, that we're not important. And I, you understand his frustration so much, but then, like you said, it's two extremes. It's like, you can't just have a talk about this. You can't just, you can't talk to Hakoda. If you were really brothers in the sense of fighting side by side for your for your nation for for your tribe, mm-hmm. why don't you just talk to him? You know what I mean? It's like all this could be resolved by like maybe having conversations that they aren't having, um, and maybe when they do, there will be conflict, but eventually something will work out. But that's you know you gotta have you wouldn't have a comic if everything was just okay. We agree, we agree, yay. Um, but this is a very interesting scene. I didn't expect him to put a knife to his neck. See, that's that's where you go. Like, okay, you're too extreme. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, okay, you make a lot of sense, but at the same time, this is just okay. That's ridiculous. You're about to kill Hakoda's son. Like, are you kidding me? Um, and it's like, what were you planning to do? You're you're standing in front of the world's best waterbender. It was it was a little, that scene was a little bit ridiculous to me. But the fight scene is pretty cool up until the point with the conversation with the old guy. But uh, I like the panel here. I I like 62 and 63 like how that looks even though like i said earlier action doesn't quite get across well the look of these pictures is nice to look at you know what i mean like with her with the water arms and him with like just constantly knocking people out with his weapons it's it's, it's cool uh cool stuff yeah i think the most obvious kind of insult that's coming across that like gilak sees from the north is that yeah they consider us savages that they have to come down here and teach us how to be civilized but that's their version of what being civilized is. They just have a, a tribal kind of culture, and that's that's fine. Just like the the air nomads have a monk-like culture. It doesn't suit everyone, but for them, it's fine. You don't have to change that. And I suppose that's what Melina and Malik aren't quite understanding, that their food is different for a reason. They wanted it to be slightly different, that they don't have to have these giant, super official buildings and stuff like that. And... Galak very much appreciates the way he talks about stuff, like he's immediately planning for war, brothers in arms, that sort of thing. He is the the warrior kind of chieftain that that, that he kind of wants Hakoda to be. Um, so you can see that. And I, I do like that Katara is kind of like, no, I, I want to hear more of what he has to say, but she's kind of aware that he is dangerous and can handle it. I like the little, the little uh, wink that Sokka gives uh, Katara, even though he has a knife through his throat. She's, that he has confidence that she can get him out of this situation and it works out quite ni- nicely, but uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on what the last bit of what Gilak has to say here? Yeah, no, it definitely is sort of interesting just to see, you know, how he he views that the whole rest of the world views, you know, the Southern Water Tribe and how they're, you know, essentially, you know, savages in the eyes of everyone else because, you know, they're not so advanced in technology or their, you know, their government is, you know, done a different way that, you know, other nations generally sort of can't understand yet, you know, for, you know, many years it has actually worked, you know, for the most part, except for, you know, the most recent last hundred years. So it's definitely just ready to see sort of his sort of, I guess, sort of his extreme sort of viewpoint here and how, you know, how it's just really, you know, it's just unhinged at this point. It's really, you know, there's no sort of turning back for him. Like, there's no other way. I mean, this is the, the part of the comic where you can definitely see that he will be, you know, probably our main sort of antagonist um, in this actual, you know, series in some form or fashion other than, you know, some other couple, you know, points that will probably sort of pop up here and there. I mean, I think the panel that they show with just his eyes definitely sort of gets inside your mind sort of how sort of uh, ominous he can sort of be here. But no, it definitely is sort of a... A nice prelude into the whole sort of uh, chase and escape scene here that I think is definitely really nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that action scene that happens is basically uh, Katara and Sokka against a bunch of uh, southern kind of patriot soldiers. Uh, obviously, Katara is the only waterbender from the south, so they're all basically it's just the two of them facing off against a bunch of warriors with like swords, melee weapons, and uh, Sokka's holding his own with his kind of uh, knife kind of club type thing, and Katara's. Katara's actually using a bit of a kind of ming Wah style, basically, even though she still has her own arm, she's kind of doing that same style thing, a little bit of kind of octopus form, and they basically manage to defeat everyone they come across. They escape through the wall because of Katara's waterbending, she kind of melts through the wall, stops them in their place, but they come across, uh, obviously, Gilak's second-in-command, uh, Thod, T-H-O-D, the old guy who was telling the stories, and he basically stops them and tells them a story, and it's pretty interesting. Um, he says, once upon a time, a snow rat learned to talk and walk on his hind feet. The humans found him entertaining, so they invited him to sit at their campfire. 
After a while, the snow rat forgot that he was still a snow rat. Uh, he asked for a home for himself, a fishing boat, and a place on the tribal council. Um, uh, but humans never forgot that he was a snow rat. They were insulted by his requests, so they chased him away back into the cold where he forever shivered and gnashed his teeth, haunted by the memories of the humans' campfire. Uh, obviously Sokka and Katara are incredibly confused by this and they just kind of brush right by him after this but I think this is worth talking about in that this is clearly a Southern Water Tribe folk story uh, legend or something like that and there's a few different ways you can tie it into what this overall story is about. One way is to treat the Snow Rat as the Southern Water Tribe and the humans as the Northern Water Tribe that the you know the animalistic savage you know uh, southern water tribe uh, gradually gaining some level of civilization and wanting respect for that but the north not giving them that or th th there's definitely a few ways of looking at it I think it's just a very interesting dynamic that they tend to go for here the emphasis on cold shivered the campfire um, and just the fact that this is the story that this guy chooses to tell them probably one of the the older men left in the Southern Water Tribe tells the two of them this story of all of them. But uh, Greg, what were your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I think this definitely was pretty interesting. I mean, the whole sort of chase scene is definitely sort of very dynamic. I think they, you know, for this being sort of, you know, I guess sort of one of our, you know, I guess sort of slower sort of action scenes in the sense that, you know, there's not a whole bunch of movement going on um, with our characters. You definitely sort of get the idea that they're in sort of a battle with all these sort of, you know, southern sort of patriots here. It definitely seems like there's a lot of them. So it makes me wonder sort of where they have come from if they're sort of men from the war who all sort of side with Gillac or they're from some other sort of area who just believe in the southern sort of values here but it definitely is sort of interesting how they are sort of stopped by the old man and you know the whole idea of the story and what it could possibly sort of represent versus the south versus the north or maybe even sort of the other nations in general um is you know something to sort of keep in mind it makes me sort of wonder if this story will sort of come back later on maybe you know katara might bring this up later on down the line with as far as you know possibly you know us you know the southern water tribe going too far and they're sort of you know in their quest for change and recognition with the whole other nation so you know maybe this will lead to you know possibly some story that can lead to sort of compromise but uh it is interesting i think it is really cool and i think they definitely should have you know used their abilities to sort of get away from him right in the beginning but it is sort of a, a nice sort of prelude mm -hmm. and uh kelly uh, what are your thoughts on the action scene and then this story from thawd I thought this was a really interesting thing to do because, you know, it's an action scene and you got to get out of there fast. But just to have this, uh, the way he says it, too, it's like you wouldn't hurt an unarmed old man, would you? And it's so like, it's like a very different way of stopping somebody than you normally see. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, OK, sure. Like, like he knows he has power over the situation for the most part because, like, he's just an old man. <laughs> That's hilarious to me for some reason. Um, and the story he tells is really interesting. I mean, to me, I got it as the rat was the Southern Water Tribe and the humans were the Northern Water Tribe, but there probably is more interpretation to it. There's probably a history to it. And I have a strong feeling that this story will come back and will have to do with the creation and formation of the Southern Water mm -hmm. Tribe separate from the Northern Water Tribe. Like maybe the idea is that there was a member of the Southern Water Tribe who had these ideas and um and was maybe just an entertainer or something or maybe just not really seen as an important northern triber but he had all these ideas that people listened to and they cared for uh or, or didn't care for or whatever and they were like oh this is funny let's listen to this guy and then like they started listening to him and then then they didn't take him seriously anymore so and then he was like screw it i'm gonna make my own tribe you know what i mean and then some people agreed i don't know if that's supposed mm -hmm. to be an allegory to that but i feel like this is gonna come back or maybe it won't, because it, it's hilarious how it's resolved as quickly as it is in the next panel, and I don't know if that's the joke. If it's that, like, okay, you could think about this story for a little bit, and it won't come back because it was just a funny thing to do while, because, you know, the next scene is really funny. Um, but this was fascinating to, to focus on, and to, again, stop them because he's an old man, because he's an unarmed old man. It's like, now you have to listen to me while they come and get you. Like, something about the situation is hilarious, but they also made it serious at the same time. Hmm. Yes, uh, but uh, to, we continue on this action scene. They pretty much manage to escape after that. Uh, Katara uses her kind of water spiral funnel thing to get them up out, and they kind of run out. But they're followed by Southerners on a new animal we're introduced to here, Snow Leopard Caribou. 
basically uh, bigger looking snow leopards with kind of uh, antlers is basically the way they look. Um, so Katara makes another ice sled and they kind of take off again. Sokka pretty quickly manages to get rid of them by distracting the snow leopard caribous with uh, Auntie Ashina's seal jerky, which he's just had in his pocket the whole time, and he just throws it away. They go off looking for the meat, and they arrive back home. Just a pretty quick little action scene. It continues the trend of each of the comics having introduced us to a new animal in the Avatar universe, and I think in interviews, Jin Yang has basically said that this is a thing that he plans to do with all of the books, that it seems like he, he's always thinking about what's the new animal he'll introduce. So uh, I, thought the, I thought this was quite fun, but uh, Kelly, any, any, any thoughts on this quick escape scene? Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, not, not a lot. I, just, I like the animal. Um, it fits very well with the, the... I like the combination of the animal. It, it makes sense to me. It looks a little bit silly, but I kind of like that it looks a little bit silly. I don't know why. Um, like, it looks like a two... Like, the idea makes sense, but the contrasting of the two animals is kind of funny. It's literally just a snow leopard, but with antlers <laughs> on it. <laughs> Something about it is funny, but it's not, not in a cheap way. Like, it, it, it makes sense for the world that they're in. I mean, come on, we have chicken pigs. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think this is one of the more creative ones out there. Um, but what is really kind of silly to me is how the seal jerky is what gets them away. <laughs> He's like, look, seal jerky! Throws the seal jerky. I'm like, okay, that's a little ridiculous. I mean, I like the fact that it was a nice callback to Aunt um, um, Aunt Ashuna's uh, great seal jerky that everyone loves. And then <laughs> that's how they get away. Um, and then the guy screaming in the back, you made it good for nothing. Like, like it, it, it's weird how they get away. The humor behind this escape scene is fascinating to me because it's such a serious situation. But then you have an old man trying to stop them and him, her like slipping him away like on water. And then, and then these two things chasing him, but with jerky getting them away. It's very strange, but I kind of like that. It, again, the second half of this comic I find much better done than the first, in my opinion. And then... But then it ends, and you're like, wait, but we just got to the cool stuff. So, yeah, it's it's awesome. It's pretty good. Yeah, it, it, it is a little silly. The, the thing that it comes across to me is that uh, Gilax Southern Patriots, or whatever we're going to call that organization, they really don't come across all that well. Because basically, Sokka and Katara, on their own, have managed to defeat, get out, and make the his whole organization look silly. So how on earth are they going to wage war with the rest of the south um and everyone else like any sort of people on katara and Sokka's side would be able to take out gilak's forces based on this it comes across a little like the new ozai society where like ultimately that was a plot <laughs> thing where they were meant to be like not as good as they thought they were gilak's group is kind of coming across like that so unless it's revealed at some point that he actually has like oh that was only like uh a twentieth of the amount of men I actually have, they really don't, don't don't come across that threatening that these two characters alone were able to take them out. But um, Greg, your thoughts on this new animal and this escape scene here? Yeah, no, I think the escape scene is really cool. I think it is. I think the new animals are definitely pretty cool. The snow leopard caribou. I mean, I think what threw me off is from the first scene we see them, you see like sort of the harnesses. So it almost makes me think that the antlers were sort of attached via the harnesses. Um, but, you know, later on, you can see they're clearly in there. So I think it definitely is, you know, a cool new sort of animal that we have in this world. And the whole callback to Auntie Ashina's sort of seal jerky, I think, is really cool. So I, I like this sort of chase scene. It does, you know, again, it does well with showing the motion of them moving in the vehicle so i think that is definitely sort of pretty cool here overall so i i enjoyed this uh chase scene that they have here that you know yeah. these two characters are pretty much easily able to sort of enter this sort of you know i guess you know you can consider it a stronghold and get away unscathed mm -hmm. so yeah we enter the last couple of pages of the book here um so they're obviously back in the city now and they go over to where grand grand is living and it's revealed that her hut is still there as it was he basically says everything else has been torn down except that hut and they basically just explain it that like mm, she's grand grand true so clearly they suggest that something in the background where because she's married to Paku and he has some sort of like uh, power as a you know powerful northerner or just that no one would go against her that she was able to keep her hut when everything else seemed to have been knocked down and that <laughs> grand grand still likes to stick to some of the the uh, the things of the south so that's an interesting little side plot that they don't emphasize a massive amount um they just say that basically catch up with the plot 
they haven't managed to get the uh, blueprints back, the briefcase back, so Malik is going to be disappointed about that. Sokka's just happy that they're alive, and he thinks that Gilak and his army of crazies need to be locked up. And then Katara says, Sokka, I know Gilak's an extremist, and she kind of trails off, and Sokka's just like, you're going you're gonna to say but, I'm sensing a but, and she says, but he's sort of got a point, doesn't he? I mean, look around and tell me this isn't a cheap imitation of the North. Uh, and Sokka just says, this looks like progress to me. Progress? This is just like what happened with... And then Katara remembers back to the point in the Rift Part 1, where she, Sokka, and Aang came across, uh, obviously, the the factory town built over the, obviously, Air Nomad kind of uh, very important uh, kind of cultural site with the Yang Chen Festival. And the kind of, we basically, Katara is feeling the same way about her home as the way Aang felt about what was being done to one aspect of his culture in that book. And Sokka's like, what happened with what? And she says, never mind, I wish Aang was here. And Sokka just says, we all do, sis. Uh, so this is, I think, an important one in that it, it, it straight away links the rift to what's going on here. And the rift for Aang was all about his conflict with Toph. And there are different approaches to the idea of culture. Is it something that should continue forward always and potentially you're living in the past? Or should you always progress and kind of uh, morph your culture to adapt to what's going forward? And, and, and with Aang, he accepted that he, he'd have to keep some of the things alive to keep the Air Nomads alive, but that he'd have to adapt it to modern times. And so the, the Yang Chen kind of uh, festival thing changed from being a very kind of uh, traditional type thing to being more of a kind of party celebration, as we saw in that. And it's suggesting something here. and. I think with Katara, she's thinking a lot about how it, it's been something across like all of the books where she's realized she hasn't focused enough perhaps on Aang's culture when she is probably going to be very important with that going forward. But um, I just thought it was very interesting to have Katara think about this and a very interesting way to use Aang, even though he's not in this book at the moment. But um, Greg, uh, wh what are your thoughts on uh, this scene here? Yeah, no, I think it is indeed a very way interesting way of using Aang, just the whole idea of the tradition versus modernism and, you know, how things are progressing and how things are changing. And, you know, it is a nice sort of contrast here just to see the shot of, you know, Grand Grand sort of hut here in between these two large buildings with like what looks like a bridge on top of it. So it definitely is sort of a stark contrast. And yeah, no, for me, it just seemed like she would just, you know, she would never give up her home regardless of any sort of change in her being, you know, probably one of the elders in the village, you know, would be able to have that sort of pull to keep it there. But it definitely is sort of interesting scene just to see, you know, Katara's thoughts on, you know, progress and change and, you know, how Sokka generally, you know, is all for sort of progress and change and doesn't necessarily, you know, remember to sort of events the same way that Katara does with her, you know, her involvement with Aang. So it definitely is sort of interesting here. And, you know, it gives you a nice sort of prelude to how sort of, you know, Aang will sort of, you know, come, you know, come down here and how he'll sort of, you know, try to help with the situation down here. Like, I like, I'll, I'll always remember that moment from, I think it was the promise part two or three, where she thought she was going to give out to Aang for basically for being around all those girls who were part of the, um, the kind of air societies that they created in like Bossing Say and stuff like that, the fan club for Aang. And then just before she could give out to him, like Aang said, you know, I'm just glad to have like people around me who actually like care about my kind of traditions and stuff like that. And she realized that she was horrible for even like thinking that he was kind of happy to be around all these girls when it was just this idea that no, he kind of misses his culture and having people who feel similarly about that. And she, it seemed like she was gonna. She was making an effort after that to kind of be more involved in that, like sit in on the kind of uh, lectures he was giving to the air acolytes after that, and it, it it seems to be linking to that. Like we had the g scene with the in with Gilak where he mentioned the air nomads being wiped out. She had a reaction to that, and now she's remembering it again. Um, and then the other point is just with regards to her relationship with Aang. This is probably the, the longest she's been away from Aang in a very long time. So like they're a kind of fairly newly together couple than being separated for this long is it's probably affecting her as well so uh kelly uh, what, what are your thoughts on this scene here a little flashback to the yeah uh you guys had some really interesting thoughts on this i don't know how much else i could elaborate with that um 
but yeah, it's true. Um, Aang not being there is clearly affecting her. And you brought up a really good point connecting this to the Promise Part 2 in that she feels much more attached to the idea of culture now and how culture should be like, you know, there needs to be a... I, I mean, at the same time, this was the same person who said there needs to be a comp not compromise between the Fire Nation and the Earth Kingdom with the new society. But I think she's also realizing now that culture is really important. And like you said in the Promise Part 2, she didn't realize like how much Aang had lost and like... Like, when it came to culture, not just the people, but the ideas behind what the people represented. And I think she realized that that's what happened in the South. Not just now, but even when she left in her home in general. Like, she wanted to go back to that life in that culture, but it's completely gone. And, it, again, you br it, the, the, it, it brings up the conversation of, like you said, well, what's better? You know, like, keeping traditions and culture and everyone happy or, like, you know, having progress that will also make people happy. Like, like it's... It's again. I'm very, I'm very concerned and very interested. What's going to happen with Sokka and Katara here? You know what I mean? Like this, this, like in a sense of like, I mean, Sokka didn't get like angry or anything, which is good. He was just like, this looks like progress to me, which in a sense it sort of is. But I think I'm more on Katara's side in this sense, in that it does look like just the Northern Water Tribe. You know what I mean? It's just them, and you know they are approaching this in the sense of they're eradicating the Southern Nation's culture, um, just like how they, how Aang felt in the Rift. But what I'm interested to see in how the message of this comic is going to be different from the Rift, because in the Rift they accepted that things need to have progress and that things need to, um, but also stay culturally rooted. And to me, that's kind of what you think they would do again. You know what I mean? Like, okay, well, we need to have this other water tribe, but progress is also good. How are they going to do this differently? Or are they going to do this differently? I would hope that they would do this sort of differently because it'd almost be the exact same thing as the Rift again, but with the Southern, the, the, the Southern, the Northern and the Southern tribes. So I'm hoping that there's a difference here more based on history than anything else between the Southern and the Northern tribes. And it's it's just such a really interesting, it's an interesting scene and it makes me worried because, you know, and, you know, she wishes Aang was there, which, you know, that Aang is going to come in later, hopefully, unless the comics covers live twice um but no he, he has to come back in later at this point um based on how bad things get between the south and the north um and yeah this whole thing is this little pause here after the action is just very hmm. reflective of the, the 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 conflict they're that the rest of the book is going to have the rest of the books are going to have hmm. yeah and then i think the other thing is just that i don't know if they're even trying to hint at it just yet but we obviously know katara and Anne get married and like she is responsible for kind of helping to bring airbenders back with obviously Tenzin later and uh, I think it's, we assume she and Aang lived on Air Temple Island for a certain point of time or at least in near Republic City and um, so it may be her kind of accepting at, at some point that she is going to have to uh, have this kind of life where she kind of has these kind of dual cultures like her own water tribe southern culture but also that she's going to be have to be reasonably involved in the air nomad culture going forward as well. And uh, I don't really know how they are going to approach that because obviously Aang's not here just yet. There's no obvious hint just yet that there's going to be any like proposals yet between Aang and Katara. But um, it's, it's definitely something to keep in mind. But um, we'll continue on. So uh, Malik comes out and he says, you know, they're just happy that, uh, they're, ba that they're back. Melina is okay. She's just woken up. Uh, they apologize to him for not being able to get the briefcase back and he seems really annoyed by it like he kicks the the snow and he says that it's not just about the briefcase it's about justice uh which i, I laughed a little bit when i just read that it's like, superhero stuff always makes me kind of laugh a little bit whenever anyone says justice i always hear it as like justice and stuff like that um but he, what he says next is really important um, Melina is the single most important person in the world to me, and those ruffians hurt her. If this were the North Pole, they wouldn't have even been able to leave the restaurant, let alone the city. Um, we the Northerners have rules and regulations, you understand, and police to enforce them. But here in the South, you're all just a loose collection of tribes, each with its own notion of justice. Um, and Sokka says, we know, uh, we know where they're hiding. Our dad's the head chief, and he'll bring them to justice. Okay, don't worry. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. That's why what Melina and I are doing is important. And Katara kind of confronts him on this. What exactly are you doing, Malik? And Sokka's a bit concerned, like, why are you talking to him like that? He and his wife are, are building our future, Katara. And we get the whole confusion about that. You know, like, no, no, we're, we're, she's my sister. I'm not married to her. Uh, we get the kind of little joke 
misinterpretation about that. I thought that was completely unneeded. They could have just said that earlier on. Um, the only thing it served was to interrupt whatever Malik's next response was going to be, which was, why does he feel it's so important to change the South? So we'll, we'll discuss the final two pages next, but I think Malik is, is very interesting here in that you, you see that he's liked the Southern food and some aspects of the Southern culture, but here we see that, oh no, he's, he still likes the rules, regulations, the police, the, the you know, civility around the Northern tribe, that they're more like, you know, they're more like the, the Fire Nation, the Earth Kingdom, they have police forces and stuff like that. And he's not really liking the tribal aspect of the South all that much either. And it's clear that to some extent he wants to change that and he feels like what they're doing is going to help. But Greg, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Malik here? Um, yeah, this is definitely interesting to get, you know, more interaction with him and more ideas on his sort of, you know, the way that he thinks things should be, which is definitely more towards, you know, the northern way of thinking with the whole sort of police force and, and, and you know, just a government that actually sort of enforces laws rather than, you know, the tribe who has their own sort of sense of, you know, justice here where they, you know, they bowled that a couple of times here. And just uh, the whole idea of him sort of saying this sort of fashion definitely sort of, you know, it's not necessarily nefarious in any sort of way, but it definitely leads you to understand and of course with Qatar sort of mentioning sort of what are you trying to do here Malik um you know it leads you to think that there is definitely something you know more going on here and you know just the fact that he was so concerned over his briefcase you know makes you think that you know there definitely is sort of something sort of going on um but no it is it is some sort of a nice sort of scene here to sort of cap it off it definitely sort of you know it leads you towards you know what's going to happen later on that you know something something big something that you don't quite understand yet is going to happen so I like the fact that they have it here. I mean, the whole idea with Saka and the mis sort of understanding is, I don't know, that seems sort of typical of these sort of situations. So nothing really crazy stood out to me about that part other than, you no, know, it's just sort of set up for the next, next sort of scenes. But, you know, it worked well for getting, I guess, a bit more in Malik's sort of character. And I, I think especially given what we're going to discuss in the next two pages, uh, Malik seeming kind of indifferent to Hakoda, saying maybe he will, maybe he won't. Uh, I think that's potentially pretty interesting with regards to how mm -hmm. Malik sees Hakoda, but uh, maybe I'm trying to find a villain in this uh, too easily. But um, Kelly, uh, what are your thoughts on these two pages with Malik? Yeah, this is really interesting to me. Um, I I get I what I get out of the situation is that he probably will ultimately end up being more of the villain than anybody else because he acted like as though he you know the Southern Water Tribe you know he cares about them. maybe he doesn't really like the food better I don't know <laughs> but um to me it's more like. Like, when he says, you know, if this were the North Pole, they wouldn't have been able to leave the restaurant, let alone the city. Like, like clearly, he's someone that's so rooted to their... to He's so rooted to his culture and how things should be done in his beliefs that he's not respecting the Southern the southern tribe at all for what they do. And he's just imposing... He, he's taking the sense of leadership. He's imposing his beliefs onto Hakoda, kind of, and onto... Um, onto the entire tribe when that's not his place to say he's like the, and then when he says that's why Molina and I are doing are so important you're like okay we're getting into something but then you know Sokka has to question Katara which it actually surprises me how dense Sokka is in the scene like I know Sokka can be dense and like he and I understand his belief that progress is definitely important and so I'm not saying that's not a thing but the fact that he just kind of ignored everything uh, Malik just said about like we northerners have rules and regulations under the police and enforce them and it's like he's saying all these kind of really insulting things about this other water tribe and then Sakuji doesn't say anything about it he's just like look look we'll we'll handle it okay i'm actually and so i don't understand why Sokka got that like upset over Katara being like and what exactly are you doing it's like well does Sokka even know what he's doing you know what i mean so like i don't know you you know it did feel a little bit forced that part it was just a way to stop malik from giving his master plan <laughs> you know what i mean giving his uh and to me i actually think that um in the based on, you know based on the end of the final panel of this comic i do feel like it will probably be him that's the more evil one i don't know i could be very wrong um but uh and i i kind of like the misunderstanding though i think it was a funny joke even though we already knew that they were brother and sister based on um the, the, the descriptions or whatever of the book, but it was a funny thing. To, they never, if anyone, you know, we look into this stuff more detailed than other people do. Anyone could have picked up this book and like, oh, okay, like, you know, they wouldn't have known they were brother and sister. They don't look very much alike, so that's that's definitely a thing. Um, uh, yeah, but that was a funny interlude, I guess. But to me, I'm a little bit surprised at how dense Sokka is being here. Just, like, like, 
I get he is that kind of character, and I believe, and I respect his belief of, like, you know, you know, things need to progress, not everything is about that, and, you know, we used to live in tiny little before, you know what I mean, but, uh, uh, He's. I'm. I'm actually kind of. I, this scene kind of annoys me a little bit with Sokka, and I hope that there starts to be. I hope a conversation is had soon, like yeah. a real one between Katara and Sokka at some point, because I understand where Sokka is sort of coming from, but he's completely ignoring the obvious red flags here. Mm. Yeah, like they just haven't like developed his opinion on the matter. He's just like accepting what's going on, kind of like the whole situation we said. Like you don't care about North and South food, do you? And they're probably going to do something with the fact of this, like he is so focused on technology advancement that sort of thing we, we know he's kind of the inventor guy that something big will probably happen where he begins to see the problems and kind of more sides with them I, I can't really see them doing something where they just have Sokka on completely the other side of the issue maybe they will but I don't quite see that happening but um anyway last two pages um so Sokka gets out of this awkward misunderstanding by saying, uh, have you seen our dad around? As he goes to, uh, uh, Malik says he's in there with Melina pointing to Grand Grand's hut. Um, he immediately goes to open the door as Katara says, Sokka, you can't just barge in there. Where are your manners? You have to knock. And they walk in and they see Hakoda kissing Melina, who is on the bed. Um, so yeah, just a, kind of unexpected the way they went about showing this. Um, but ultimately, I think it's thing a lot of people ended up calling that once we met Molina, if she was in or around Hakoda's age, this was probably going to be a plot they went for. Um, I think very quickly after we got the description for part one, I said something along the lines of this in one of the podcasts. So it wasn't a massive surprise to me, but the way they actually show it here was just like, whoa, them just walking in on this was a bit like that sudden. But yeah. Um, really interesting way to end it kind of showing that okay this this clearly highlights that there was a relationship developed before now this is just the thing that confirms it and then it's the most obvious way of kind of showing Katara and Sokka that this is the thing and you'll probably create some sort of a conflict with Katara kind of realizing now that Melina is kind of influencing Hakoda's decisions and he's not thinking himself don't know how Sokka's going to react to it really um but definitely interesting. But uh, Kelly, what are your thoughts on this cliffhanger ending to the book? I must have missed that podcast because this completely, like, I did not see this coming at all. I kind of did when the first panel showed up and they're both walking in and we're not seeing immediately what's going on. And then when I, uh, as a, um, and then when they were like knock and they had the shocked faces, I just looked, I, I just looked down and I was like, oh, what? Like I was just as shocked as they were. I don't know if that makes me an idiot, but I didn't see this coming at all. Uh, and once I saw it, it, I looked back when I read it again, I was like, oh my God, it makes so much sense. You know what I mean? Like, like they foreshadowed it pretty well, not amazingly well, but I shouldn't have been as shocked as I was, but this is, oh my God. And then I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't paying attention. And I flipped in the next page, and I was like, this is the last page? Yeah. I was like, how do they end it like that? Like, this is one of their crazy, in my opinion, this is almost crazier than the cliffhanger when, when Toph's dad, when Toph's dad showed up at the end of part one of the rift. I was like, oh, my, or was that part two? No, it was part one, I think. I don't remember. Uh, but, oh my god, like, this completely, and I'm, to me, I'm just curious about Katara and Sokka's reaction to this in the next book. I know Katara's gonna be flipping out. Like, I, like, I don't I don't know what exactly she's gonna do, but she's gonna be like, ah! <laughs> not only with, you know, not caring for Melina's sense of, you know, how she views this other water tribe, but also Katara's close connection with her mother you know it's like oh man this and then and Sokka I don't know how he's gonna react I'm gonna be very interested to see how he reacts because I don't think it's gonna be I'm fine with food either way kind of reaction <laughs> you know what I mean like how he's been reacting to the to the you know about how things have been changing I don't think I would actually be hugely disappointed if they go that route because I at this point I'm gonna be bothered by how they're writing Sokka if they just don't care about like if he's just that being that dense about everything um so I am so angry that it ended here because I'm like I need to know what happens and now like it, it's it's oh man I don't know I don't know what else to say I was in shock I was like oh this is gonna be so interesting yeah, especially with, as I said earlier on, the decision to have the book open up with Katara dreaming about her mother. She is, her, her mother is still on her mind, like, uh, and her mother means so much to her, kind of like, kind of character-defining relationship for Katara. 
Um, so obviously it's it's not something she's ever going to like forget or anything like that. But it's it. I think what they're going for here is that it's highlighting that just as much as the whole cultural moving on kind of aspect, like will Katara be able to accept like her father moving on and starting another relationship or something like that, or will she still feel that no, 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 like mom was the only one he could ever be with and and that's that um and how exactly she deals with that uh yeah Sokka it could go either way how he reacts uh I'm not really sure but uh Greg what are your what's your take on this final cliffhanger page um yeah I think it's definitely sort of interesting I mean for me personally it didn't really sort of surprise me that much it seemed like they sort of were were leading towards this sort of way of you know relationship between the two of them and you know especially when the whole idea of brother sister then you know it's pretty much you know guaranteed that that's sort of going to happen but I think it definitely is nice it definitely makes you know it adds more drama to the series overall which you know generally is a pretty good thing as long as they do it well so this sort of you know conflict that you know Katara has with you know her whole culture being changed as well as with her father you know having changed and possibly moving on you know it's definitely something to sort of look forward to in the next sort of comic so I think it's you know even though of course you want to know more you want to know what happens you know I think it's definitely sort of a, a good cliffhanger for fans who you know are so sort of in, in deep with these sort of characters here I think it's definitely something that leads toward you know more excitement in the coming chapters um coming books so I think it you know it should work pretty well as long as they don't you know do anything too odd yeah i think the, the only fear i have right now is that at this point i'm kind of like i actually just want melina to turn out to be good i, I don't want there to be some reveal that she was <laughs> uh, evil all along using hakoda to get into this relationship with him and become the the like queen you know like wife of the chieftain controlling things from the background because uh, he respects her opinion above all else or something like that um I'm actually kind of fine with, like, just Melina's fine, and the focus is more on how Katara is dealing with this situation happening. Um, I think probably there's still some reveals to come with Melina and uh, also Malik, but I, I definitely hope they more, if they're doing anything with these two, that Malik is the one doing the bad stuff and Melina is misguided, perhaps, in some of what she's doing, maybe because her brother has influenced her. Uh, I'm just not overly sure like the, this is an interesting plot but they could take this in a direction where it's going to annoy a lot of people but um i suppose kelly has uh, some final thoughts here where do you really think they're they're going with this now like starting part two yeah. this happening the as we get in the next page coming january 2017 team avatar oh reunited in part two january yeah how, how, how do you think they're going to do this? Introducing uh, Toph and Aang back into the story and this as a big reveal from the end. Man, of the I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I feel like they still have so much to cover with just these water tribe conflicts. And I think they will. But by bringing Toph and Aang to the mix at the same time, maybe we're just having another cover lie. Maybe Toph will show up at the end of the book at the last second. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't really know. I, to me, I'm more thinking about, like, you know, you know, just like what you said, I'm with you on, I really hope, like, as soon as I saw that last panel, my mind just went to, oh, I really hope the brother's evil. <laughs> I really hope it's the brother and not her, because I would feel so bad, and it would be so cliche, you know what I mean, to have, it's like, she's just using him to, to, you know, take over or whatever. Like, I don't want her to be, I don't want her to end up being that one, that, uh, you know, cliche, and if anything, I'd rather the brother be cliche or something, uh, because that would just be really messy, and like he said, it would annoy a lot of people the way they handle that, and I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen in part two, I'm very clueless as to, this is one of the few times where part two, I'm just very, like, I have no idea, like, like, completely clueless on what they're going to do, because part one was kind of so obvious as to what they were going to do outside of their final last couple pages, um, you know, establishing characters again, setting conflict between Katara and the changes in the city, Sokka not caring as much, there being some kind of order to, like, you know, have more southern uh, culture cultures being pertained. Um, that all was stuff I kind of expected in some shape, way, or form. But from here on out, after this last panel, I don't know. I really have no idea. And I... I want to know now, and I don't like that it's January. <laughs> I know I'm complaining. I sound like a baby, but, like, how could they end it like that? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Uh, okay, here's uh, I'll read out the, the description for part two because I think it's interesting so, that we know. Because I forgot all uh, of those descriptions. <laughs> okay, after attempting to kidnap Katara and Sokka, Southerner Gilak leaves a haunting note for Hakoda. Soon you will see the truth, Chieftain. The vow leaves everyone on edge, including Katara, who remains wary of the, tri uh, the two tribes' integration. As Northerner Molina announces a partnership with the company owned by Toff Bay Fong's father, her own brother comes forward to defame her. Have Katara's worst fears been confirmed? So Malik does something that puts Melina's reputation up in the air is something that's going to happen here. This, I think, leads me to believe that it probably will be that the brother is the evil one. And they'll try to make it out like Melina's bad and has done some stuff, but it's she, the brother's using her as a scapegoat or something like that. I think that's what they're planning, maybe. But uh, Greg, uh, what are your thoughts on where they'll go from here? Yeah, I mean, without reading too in deep to sort of like, you know, what they say is going to happen to summary. Um, I mean, for me, I would think that this would somehow, you know, once, you know, Katara and, you know, um, Sokka get over, you know, this, this shock here and, you know, there is sort of immediate sort of conversations and, you know, Katara's, you know, initial sort of resistance to this whole sort of thing. I mean, once they sort of explain the whole idea with the resistance that we know is going to, you know, come into a larger part of conflict in the third part, you know, it makes me think that the whole idea of them sort of forming the partnership with um, Toph's sort of dad's sort of company is sort of the, I guess, maybe possibly sort of speed up the progress that's sort of happening here. And, you know, of course, any sort of speed up of change will, you know, cause sort of more conflicts here. So I don't know. I mean, it, it definitely can go in various sort of different ways. I mean, I think I like that it's more sort of open than sort of, you know, you can sort of figure it out automatically other than sort of description summary. Um, because, you know, this one was, like we've mentioned before, pretty sort of pretty sort of straightforward, pretty linear. There weren't too many sort of crazy sort of surprises, but it does definitely lead you to some interesting thoughts of, you know, how the Southern Water Tribe is going to change in the future, which uh, I kind of like how they're, you know, leading us along in that aspect, at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll go into some final thoughts now and pretty much wrap up the show. Um, my final thoughts are that I think the book is really good. It presents the the kind of main issues, the kind of ideological differences over what's happening to the north, to the south, because of the north, and the different perspectives you have on that. Like primarily, you know, Melina Malik wanting to advance things, Hakoda accepting it, but maybe because of his relationship with Melina. Um, you have Sokka being fine with the progress, Katara doubting things, and then especially doubting things when she meets with Gilak, who's very against it. That's a really cool plot to set up. Then the cliffhanger with uh, the relationship reveal is very interesting. I think actually what was missing is something we discussed with the cover. Like when we first saw the cover for this, we were just we were we were actually a little bit worried. Like, oh, Ang's on the cover again. Can they really not just give Katara and Sokka a comic of their own? But actually reflecting on it now, I'm kind of like, I think what this book was missing a little bit was actually just Ang having a little involvement. I would have loved to have seen Ang show up with a couple of pages left and be like, oh, here's my quick thoughts on the, on the situation and kind of change the dynamic. I'm just a little worried now, like kind of Kelly said, that next book is going to be introducing Toph, that whole business proposition with uh, the company that her father runs, and Ang into the book while also dealing with the after effects of this cliffhanger ending and other stuff going down. I'm a little bit worried that Aang is maybe going to get swallowed up by all of this and we won't get the kind of uh, scenes that we really want, but um, it, it'll probably end up working out. I just feel like I, I kind of would have liked to have seen Aang in this, and it kind of really makes me believe that at the time that this cover was drawn, the plan was for Aang to be in part one, but then when the writing actually came down to being kind of finalized, they probably moved Aang arriving back to part two. I, I think that's probably what happened more so than them trying to lie and kind of feel the need to market everything with Aang, but uh, who knows what the exact details are. But uh, Kelly, I suppose, what are your final thoughts now that we've read through the book and analyzed it? Yeah, going through it again, um, I had already read it twice, but going through it a third time was definitely really interesting as well. Uh, when I first read it, I remember I was a little bit disappointed because I felt like I was just reading a bunch of catching up expo exposition and kind of everything I expected and there were so many words and like so many things happening for some reason it didn't quite uh it, it didn't quite hit me as much as it should but when I read it the second time and going through it again through third time for analysis this is a book that's growing on me like it's a, a, and I really really do enjoy it I still think there's some weird anachronistic and continuity issues and the 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 cliffhanger was really annoying 
but, but understandable, but kind of cool, but also annoying. I think it's like so good, it's bad kind of thing. Um, but uh, the overall, overall, my thoughts on this book are very positive. I really like it, but man, does it feel like a part one. Like it feels more part one-y than most part ones. Uh, but it, like a very, very good part one. Like I said, the, the conflict between in the north and the south and the culture of the water tribes was always something that i loved about avatar it was always something i always felt needed to have more exploration because katara and sokka are my favorite characters so i'm so glad this is happening and i'm actually happy that ang wasn't in this book if you want me to be honest i mean like i said i am concerned about Toph and ang showing up at the same time that could make things really muddled i agree with that but i'm glad that this was katara and sokka's book I'm glad that they got their time that they need as being really important secondary secondary characters, main characters that are not the main character. So, I don't know. I, I actually really, really like this book, and it kind of grows on me as I read it. Yeah, so the only thing I'd add to what I said was just that I hope they find a way to use Sokka in a more serious way. Agreed. I still feel Agreed. they're still treating him as kind of the comedic character. They roughly yeah. make up for it with the whole, like, you led the invasion of Black Sun thing, but I'm kind of like okay, can we see a little bit more of that? He was cool in the fights here, but I still feel that, like, you know, he needs to get his sword back and, like, demonstrate those skills again or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Or they, something needs to happen where he makes a big decision about what side he's on in this situation. Yeah, uh, I actually meant to, you reminded me, I forgot to, I, I was going to mention that as well. <laughs> I was going to mention that, that, I don't know why I forgot about that. I was going to say one of the negatives that I have and still kind of do with the comic is that Sokka, while an opinion that is not surprising, it is totally definitely what you would think he would think about, is acting not very serious to the situation. He's kind of just letting things happen. And I'm wondering if there's a reason behind that. Like if he, like in the sense that like, he he doesn't want to think about it or like or like he just genuinely do, is that oblivious to culture and oblivious to change and stuff but i'm really hoping that they flesh out his character more in book two and book three that's that's kind of a that's one of my main concerns so far is hoping that he's not just a comedic throughout this whole thing because he's he's an actual complex character like in the show but then he's not acting like it so far and uh greg what are your final thoughts on north and south part one um, you know, overall, I really sort of enjoyed the comic. I mean, despite, you know, it's some parts seem like they're just sort of leading you along and it being sort of a part one, introducing you to sort of, you know, old concepts and, you know, sort of things that we sort of already knew. I think it does do a good job of just, you know, reintroducing us to the Water Tribe, you know, seeing some parts that we know from the series, you know, the whole nostalgia thing as well as, you know, getting to know some new characters and, you know, creating this new sort of conflict that'll lead us into the next two parts, which, you know, definitely did get more interesting in the later half of this book. And, you know, with the characters here, you know, I'm sure they'll flesh them out a bit more. I mean, I could see Sokka doing more with his sort of consulting role than anything else as far as, you know, maybe somehow actually sort of, you know, getting an idea of the culture and integrating that more into sort of the actual sort of buildings that they're building here. Um, so I, I think there's definitely sort of potential for Sokka to do, you know, some inter interesting things in this series overall. So I think it's heading in a good direction as long as they keep going towards, you know, the path that most of the comics have gone so far. Mm -hmm, definitely. I think I think most of the comics have shown us that even if we have some doubts after part one, they can bring it together. Uh, you know, North and uh, Smoke and Shadow, you know, did its own thing and let us down a little bit, but it was still a really good series. So I'm I'm excited for part two and three. It's just it's going to be a really long wait until January and then well, March, April for part three, um, and I, that that's going to be the frustration always. But for now, that's our kind of opinions on the book. I'm sure next time we have an Avatar podcast, we'll discuss it a little bit more as more people get the book and more opinions come out. But uh, for now, that's that's the that's the review for North and South Part One. So, uh, in the, uh, if you want to send uh, your own opinions on the book to us, and we can maybe do that on the next show, read them out. Uh, email address for the podcast is avataronlinepodcast at gmail .com. Uh, we have two Tumblr pages which you can send questions into. Ask boxes are open. Uh, avataronlinepodcast.tumblr.com and avatarthelastairbenderonline.tumblr.com. And then there's the site, avatarthelastairbenderonline.com. I have a written review up on the site, um, a video review up on the site as well. And um, you can check out those and discuss the book on the site and uh, obviously send us questions there if you remember as well. Definitely send us your thoughts on the book so we can have other opinions to go off next time we have an Avatar podcast. A uh, final thing to say is that next week's podcast will return to the Movers podcast, and it's going to be uh, the next one is going to be for my next pick of show, which is the uh, anime Haikyuu, 
the volleyball anime so we'll be reviewing the first two episodes of that next week on the podcast but uh, for now that has been the review special for North and South Part 1 it's been myself Greg and Kelly thanks for listening to this podcast and bye 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 bye